Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with good old Jim Ross. Jim, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm good, buddy. I could not be better. It's a great week here in Oklahoma. My lady uh, Sooner softball team got eliminated by UCLA. I, I was all, all about, all in, by the way, on the uh, College World Series. I, I will tell you that last week, I know you were out of the country. It was a good thing because I was going to call you. <laughs> uh, when my Sooners eliminated, they didn't eliminate, but they beat Alabama. And, but boy, Alabama's got a good team. And it was fun. I was just bullshitting you. I, didn't, I wasn't going to call you. But it was, uh, you know, my spend my, I'm able to spend my, with this AEW thing now, I got a little bit of my life back. And I do things that people probably wouldn't suspect me doing. And that was including going to the uh, Women's College World Series, which I think is a very underrated event. I enjoy the hell out of it. I got to tell you, I uh, finally had a chance to sit down and watch the broadcast version of Double or Nothing. Man, you were on your shit that night. I just want to tell you how much fun it was as a fan to hear you doing what you do best. And you could tell you were enjoying yourself. And it almost felt like you came in with a chip on your shoulder. You were ready to prove something. Yeah, you know, even some of my peers uh, whispered around the business that, well, you know, he may have lost it. He may be, he may have passed him by. And and uh, and even some, and the, some of the wrestling media, well, Excalibur should be doing the play-by-play. I think Dave Meltzer even mentioned this. Excalibur should be doing the play-by-play. -play. I don't know what the hell my role is going to be. Uh, and X, by the way, Excalibur did a great job. He's really good, and he's going to be a big-time star in that world. And and uh, and Alex Marvez, it's an all-new deal for him. But the bottom line is that we're—he's a smart guy, hard work, did a lot of work behind the scenes getting us ready, uh, note-wise and prep-wise. But gosh dang, you know, you're working out a net, and we had not had that—that that we had no way to replicate what we were going to do in Las Vegas beforehand. So I, I, I think we put, we did put out the effort. I think we did a solid job for sure. And uh, I know that we'll get better in time. And I think by the time we get to uh, August in Chicago, that uh, uh, we'll be, we should be a lot better and, uh, and, and all that. So I'm, I'm happy with it. I appreciate you. I'm glad you liked it. I just, I, I can't understand, you know, people think, well, he's been away so long. This is the only thing I've ever done. I mean, how, how long, how far away can I be? You know, I used to tell guys this, I'll tell you, us wrestling people, we live on Uranus during the week and just do wrestling on the weekend. We don't know nothing about anything. So, uh, I, I had a good time and, and I appreciate, I'm glad you liked it. Most folks seem to like it, but uh, it's a work in progress and we'll get better. And uh, I enjoy working with my partners to tell you, I love a three man booth would be a lie. I don't, but that's the, that's where we're assigned to do. And that's, so that's what I'm doing. It's pretty simple. I'm not going to overthink that deal. So that's uh, that's how it looks. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad you liked it, Connie. Thank you. Well, and I'm looking forward to uh, talking about our topic today. It's King of the Ring 1997. And Jim, you watched this for the first time in a long time this week. What did you think? I sat outside yesterday and watched the entire show on my iPad, believe it or not. And uh, I, I got into it and I liked it. I remember so many nice memories of things that I had forgotten about. I had forgotten that Vince McMahon and I were the broadcasters on that show, uh, and uh, the King, who was on our team, our three-man team, which is a, kind of the exception, not the rule of the three-man philosophy I have, 
uh, was in the tournament. So he did not broadcast that night, which made him extremely happy. I do call that, uh, the King was almost, uh, uh, euphoric. The fact that he's got, he got to wrestle on the pay-per-view and not and have to sit out there for uh, three hours and broadcast one. So it was an underrated show. I thought the, a lot of the, uh, the Austin Michaels, uh, rivalry and that, you know, it was a little bit, uh, forgotten from that match. I, I, they had a hell of a match by the way. Uh, and you know, there was triple H Paul Levesque got his, uh, opportunity to, to get on the, you know, get noticed, start getting a push as it were, uh, after he'd being punished, whatever the hell that meant, uh, from the, from the curtain call we've talked about before. So that was a big start for him. And, uh, and I forgot how good Goldust was, to be honest with you. God dang, he's talented as hell in that gimmick he did. And he and uh, Terry, his wife at the time, Marlena, that was a good booking. That was a good, a creative piece of business, in my opinion. And uh, it really worked well, I thought. And looking back at it, you kind of regain your appreciation for how good they, they were together. There's also another saga in the chapter of Ahmed Johnson. You know, that was always an interesting road to travel. So, uh, Farouk. It's just you a know, lot got, to get into on this show. Yeah, I mean, it's a ton. And there's a lot of backstory. There's a, you know, I look at these shows that we do, Conrad. It, and of course, these are your ideas, and I love them. I love for you to call the plays. And, and that is the fact that these things are like, they're, they're, we're talking about a show or an event, but, we, it, or, but it's also about a big ensemble cast surrounding that event or show we're talking about. So, and this one's got a massive cast that we can talk about. It does. And it's almost like a time capsule. And, and I want everybody listening to the show. If you're digging what we're doing here on the new format here on Jim's podcast, grill and JR tell a friend, you know, even though something may be titled King of the ring 97, it's really more of a snapshot of the summer of 1997 and the WWF and all the news and notes. Cause we're not just going to cover the show as if it happened in a vacuum. We're going to talk about the things that got us there as well. Of course, King of the ring went down on June 8th. Uh, so like 22 years ago from this weekend at the Providence center right there in Providence, Rhode Island. And this is a pretty crucial time for the WWF. The NWO is running rough shot over in WCW and they are running away with the Monday night war. So we're trying to play catch up here on the WWF side of the fence. Uh, we're on the heels of WrestleMania 13, where maybe the original plan was Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. Shawn pulled up lame in February, lost his smile and chaos was created. So. Brett wound up working with Stone Cold Steve Austin in an all-time classic, one of the best matches in company history and even wrestling history. The main event, of course, became The Undertaker's Night, where he beat Sid Vicious, and then we would transition into Cold Day in Hell in May, where we would first see Steve Austin get his first world title singles match on a pay-per-view, which he lost against the reigning world champion, The Undertaker. And there's lots of backstage drama going on at this Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels saga continues to evolve and the Hart foundation is now going strong. No longer just a couple guys. Now it's a whole roster of dudes. It's Brian Pillman and it's Jim Neidhart and it's Owen, it's Brett, it's bulldog. And the nation of domination is really starting to take off. Uh, Kane is about to debut in just a few months. There's just a lot going on here. So let's sort of hit the reset button and talk about, well, something you were involved in contracts um dustin rhodes the gold dust character renews his contract here and it's it's reported by wade keller that mankind his contract is expected to expire later in the summer and i wanted to talk a little bit about these two guys because at this point neither one of them are necessarily main eventers although they've both been positioned with top guys whether it was mankind and undertaker or gold dust and undertaker or mankind and Shawn Michaels, how critical were they and how nervous were you that maybe this Dustin or Mick Foley escape and go to the other side? Because we're in the middle of the Monday night war guys are jumping back and forth. Was there ever a concern that either one of these two guys would leave? Or did you feel like, no, their feet are planted here. They've been down there. They've had enough. They're glad to be on this side. Pretty much the latter, uh, scenario that you just mentioned, um, you know, Mick, uh, the WWF for Mick was always home, him growing up in Long Island, you know, the, the great stories of hitchhiking to the garden to watch uh, Jimmy Snuka uh, come off the top of the cage and Don Morocco. We've got footage, the footage of that's been played ad nauseum, but it's a cool story. It's a true story. Uh, so I didn't think Mick had any issues. The other thing, Wade Keller reported erroneously 
that uh, Mick's contract was up in the summer. It was up. It was up 18 months later. Uh, so we had a year and a half on Mick. And normally, I started talking to talents that we wanted to keep that were our prior our priorities about a year in advance. So, uh, we, but I never thought Mick was going to leave. He, he was, you know, we were doing those, uh, we did those vignettes with him, those, that sit down interview thing I did with him. And he loved that. And, and he's seeing a chance. He's, he had a chance to be work on top in the WWF. And that was a huge dream for him. As far as Goldust was concerned, you know, you nailed it. He'd been down to WCW. He'd been there. He'd been there in a couple different incarnations. Uh, you know, he had, he, he worked for his dad and Dusty was the booker. Uh, that was a tough drill for him though, quite frankly, challenging. Uh, so uh, I, I didn't think either of those two cats were going to leave us. Uh, but you know, we still had to do our due diligence, communicate with them, make sure they were cool. And, and we did that. So, and luckily they both stuck around for many years after that. One of the things I've wanted to ask about was, um, leaf Cassidy and we know him as Al snow. And we should mention here that Al snow just put a new book out. And I highly recommend it for everybody. It's an Amazon or anywhere else you enjoy books, but I read it last week. It's tremendous. I can't put it over enough, but in my research, I found that he gave notice to you guys in this era. Uh, but he was notified that, Hey, uh, you can't actually give notice. Uh, you can only do that at the end of your third year and you're at the end of your second year and yeah. you guys wanted him to stay, but he's trying to negotiate, I guess, maybe to get out of this deal or, or position himself differently. When did you realize that Al Snow was unhappy and, and why were you guys determined to hang on to him? Well, Al was a great hand and Al could make everybody he worked with better because he was, he was that fundamentally sound, which is why uh, now in OVW, we see, uh, the success that they're, are, they're getting to garner there and they're earning there in Louisville, uh, under Al's watch. He's a great teacher. He has really good instincts and, uh, we felt like we were getting ready to go through a transition period where we, we, we had to get younger. We had to change faces. We had to change our lineup and guys like Al who are veterans uh, who have proven them, proven themselves in smaller uh, territories and the independent circuit, uh, was a, was a keeper. And, uh, you know, he was, a, like I said, if his work in the ring had, when it finally faded away, which is a long time to come cause he, he still, he still wrestles. Uh, that he would be a great teacher as he's proven out to be. So, uh, but until he said he wanted to leave, he didn't understand that, you know, you can't, he, he's, he had committed for three years and we we're paying him for three years. And, uh, so we didn't have any desire to break precedent and say, okay, we're going to turn a guy loose a year early just because he wants out because that would open the door for everybody, uh, to, to want out. And then of course, a lot of that times those issues, uh, Conrad are, guys wanting to position themselves for a better money deal. That, that may have been, that may have been con or excuse me, that may have been else, uh, uh, reason, but, uh, he was, very, he was, he was very much valued. I here we are in the middle of the major league baseball season. Al was like a very talented multi-skill utility player. And those guys are invaluable. Well, and the story is really, really awesome. I can't recommend his book enough. Go out of your way to check it out. Uh, you can get it on Amazon or. Uh, Kindle or anywhere else. It's called self-help life lessons from the bizarre wrestling career of Al snow. Uh, as far as wrestling books go, it's really, really good. And it's everywhere. Barnes and Noble target. And while you're picking up books, you should pick up slobber knocker too. Right, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. Baby needs new shoes. Uh, Al sent me a copy of his book and he and I've been friends for a long time. And I, I was really proud of his effort uh, in the book is it is not a typical wrestling book. It's a book about life that everybody can relate to seriously. And Conrad's right. Be spot on in this deal. Uh, I got a copy of it about uh, two or three months ago. Uh, I thought it was exceptional and, uh, glad Al's doing well there at OVW and, and, uh, nothing could, it comes to nice people. He's, he deserves it. He works hard. Let's talk a little bit about the news and notes at the time. Wade Keller would report that the front office had made some cutbacks in late May firing longtime ring announcer, Bill Dunn. The former ECW hype central host, Lance Wright, who I guess, uh, had been with you guys for a while, a long time employee in the art department and two other office workers. And uh, also the duties of George Steele and Jay Strongbow were cut back with only one house show per night. They weren't needed as much, but have been kept on board either way. But I guess now, uh, it's sort of not cutting time for the company. We're about to, we're not too terribly far away from where 
Vince would sit down with Brett and say, I can't afford your contract. So this is sort of the first time that it makes the newsletter that, Hey, maybe, uh, maybe all's not well at the home front financially. Tell me about bill Dunn. It's a name that I'll admit. I didn't immediately recognize. He was a ring announcer, uh, that was been there for a while. When I got there in 1993, uh, bill Dunn was always overshadowed by Howard Finkel and rightfully so a uh, bill. Nice guy did a good job. Uh, but the, the, the seepage of information, uh, on, on these layoffs came, uh, was not a uh, major secret internally. You know, many of us, I took a big cut in pay. I took a, I think it was a $30,000 a year cut in pay. In 97. Yeah. And then, and, and, yeah, right on that, right, maybe right before that, uh, but somewhere in the mid nineties, I, I didn't try to commit that date to memory because it wasn't something I wanted to recall all the time, but. Uh, Vince came came in and said we were we're we're, we're having issues cash flow wise, and I'm asking the wrestling people to uh, you know take a massive cuts and take cuts in pay, and I said okay what do I need what are you offering or what are you suggesting and he told me, and uh, so I think I think I got cut to I think thirty grand I believe but nonetheless that's when uh, you go back and do, we do our research we'll see that was the week that J J Dillon. Uh, in a very upset uh, mood and rightfully so JJ had a lot of pressure on him from being a, a dad of a special needs child and, you know, three, three young children. And so, uh, JJ couldn't, couldn't, it wasn't going to work for him that, that you're getting that big cut and pay. So he, he quit abruptly and, and our, our man, Bruce got to be the head of talent relations there for a good while. Uh, and I was, this, I was a, the a senior VP of another wrestling administration, which I think Vince gave me that title. Just thought I would, it would keep me happy. I would have been happy to be Bruce's assistant. I didn't care. I was more concerned about the payday. I'm one of those two C guys. I knew what the creative was going to be, and I liked the cash. So that's where we were. But it was not a big issue. Uh, it was a bad issue for those guys and their families. But it wasn't a secret that the company was hurting, and we had to make changes. And that's why it was so important to get this, uh, some new stories established and new talents established, including Stone Cold. Who has the unenviable task of breaking the news to Strongbow and, and George Steele? Because it feels me, like mm. me. Mm-hmm. I got to do that. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't fun. I was a new kid on the block. I'd been there very long. Uh, this was 97. I've been there four years. I'd already been in and out a couple of times. Uh, and Strongbow was one of Vince's boyhood heroes. So uh, he, didn't, he, didn't, uh, he didn't need to do it, quite frankly. It's my job. Uh, and George, uh, basically the same. Uh, I don't think George had the relationship with Vince that, uh, that John, the Strongbow did. Strongbow had a great report, Vince. I remember a Strongbow always called Vince Caesar. Oh, Caesar's in a bad mood this week. Oh, 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 oh. the wrestlers love these the wrestlers love to spread bad news. This do it's inherent. Have you noticed that? I have. Yeah. They love it. Uh, Howard Finkel, God bless him. Howard's on the, been on the weather. He's not feeling great, but uh, he used to run them up. Anytime there's a death in the wrestling business, it could be in, it could be in Australia. It's an Australian underneath the indie guy. Uh, Jim, uh, I got some bad news for you, Howard. I said, of course you do, Howard. Who died this time? Well, uh, have you ever heard of going to blank? No, I hadn't heard. Well, he passed away last night. Okay, Howard. Well, let's send him flowers. Well, we want it, you know, it's like. So it's just, that's a, that's the nature of the beast. It's crazy. It was that way in 1974 when I got into it. it is, they love to talk of wrestlers are worse than women that watch soap operas in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the old day. And now I'm sounding, uh, sounding uh, chauvinistic, but most soap operas back in the day, kids were meant for women, the female viewers, look at the sponsors. And they, these ladies took those shows very, very seriously. And I grew up in a household of them. I know this. So that was cut. The wrestlers are worse. And, uh, so that, but it was, a, it was just a big layoff. I, I had, they look, we had to get more energy. We had to get more productivity from our coaches or producers or the agents as they were called at that time. And AEW, they call them coaches. They're all the same job. They help the talents put together matches, give them direction, coach them up, motivate them, help them uh, uh, to do, do good. And, uh, but not that George and Jim, uh, George, Jim, uh, Jim Myers, George Steele, weren't doing that. They were getting older and they were limited, a little bit limited on what they could do or wanted to do. So we, you know, the only incumbent, I think old time agent that we kept, uh, was, uh, uh, Jack Lanza. 
And uh, so we, Jack was, and Jack did a real good job all during that attitude area. And one of the things that kept Jack on board was the fact that he was a great communicator, former school teacher, had a good education. He communicated with me in the way that I needed him to do. I, I, anything that happened off the record would stay off the record. I got another agent report that was not public. That was just for me. If somebody was a little out of the way or messed up, Jack always gave me the, the, the full story. And sometimes it's on the phone because he didn't want to write it down, which I commended. So that was how we worked that deal. And we had to get younger. The coach, we had to get a fire there. We had to start something. And luckily all those things kind of fell into place with, uh, with those guys. One of the things I wanted to talk about was, um, Scott Putsky. I know that seems like it's out of left field, but in my research for this show, I saw that you guys were plugging the upcoming debut of Scott Putsky and you're even showing footage of his father, Ivan Putsky. And you make sure to call the footage really old. And it's a clip of him beating up Roddy Piper and you're acknowledging Roddy Piper by name. You're doing this probably as a receipt because the prior week on nitro, they showed a clip of Ric Flair beating on Vader. Then we see Scott Putsky get a win over Leaf Cassidy for whatever reason. It didn't work with Scott Putsky. What was the hope and why didn't it work out? Well, Scott had a million dollar look. He had a great name. You know, his, his father, Joe Mednarski, AKA Ivan Putsky, uh, was a big star there and he's a big star in mid South. You know, I, I knew him from the, from back in the day. Uh, so he got over, he got over big time and, uh, you know, you hope to parlay on that second generation thing. And sometimes it works and sometimes it, it's not a guarantee. Being a second generation wrestler really doesn't guarantee you anything, but that first look, uh, and, and, and something for the announcers to talk about when you're on television. Uh, Scott was a, seemed like a, a decent kid, good looking kid. Thought he was a nice athlete. It just, he didn't have the it factor. It just did not come natural for him. He could do things athletically extremely well, but I'm not so sure he knew why he was doing them. Right. So that was kind of the deal there. Good look. It, it was just all about it. Eight by tens. He's a main eventer, but it was about more than that. And it just, his skill set just didn't fit that uh, level. <laughs> One of the other things I found in my research was, um, on raw on the way to this show, the road warriors would beat PG 13, uh, in under two minutes. I should mention that PG 13 were the two white dudes in the nation of domination who would come out in hats and glasses and jackets and sort of wrap their way to the ring and their staples in Memphis. It's JC ice and Wolfie D and let me just read the recap. PG 13 cried at first, then charged the ring and pummeled the warriors with punches. The warriors didn't sell it at all. And after taking a beating, Wolfie escaped their grasp and tagged in JC ice, actually Hawk grabbed ice and then threw him into the ring. And then ice and Wolfie managed to double team Hawk and pile drop him, but he no sold it. The warriors then gave their shoulder clothesline finisher to each of them and pinned both simultaneously. PG 13 had asked for help from the NOD, but got none and were abandoned after losing the match. Now Meltzer would write PG 13 is gone after the road warriors deal. Apparently the guys think it's Jerry Lawler had him fired because they're working opposition to Lawler in Tennessee. Although that's been denied internally, they were told there is a chance they'll be brought back for the light heavyweight division, but that would likely be only for television purposes. If it happens at all, he would also say JC ice had gotten a lot of heat in his short tenure there. Chat me up. What happened with PG 13 and, and why was this the end for them? I think the, the, the short answer to the story and the bottom line of it is, is that those two kids were certainly not low on talent. Uh, we would not have hired them. If we didn't think they get, didn't have talent. Uh, but they, they were not a good fit in the locker room from a, uh, cultural standpoint, meaning, uh, I, they didn't know they were young and green and, they, and then both of them have been around since they were young, young, young kids. And I think they felt that they'd paid all the dues they needed to pay. And I might be wrong about that, but they just didn't fit well in the locker room. They had a hard time getting along with people and, uh, maybe they were not as good as they thought they were, but they certainly did not lack talent. They just lacked maturity. I think that's probably the biggest issue if they, just, they didn't have the maturity. One of the other things that happened on this same episode of raw mankind would bring Paul bear out onto the stage. And this is when Paul bear's face is wrapped up in bandages because the undertaker had thrown fire at him the prior week. 
and mankind is telling undertaker he's going to give him one more chance and this is when paul bearer is threatening uh it's a secret i made while i was standing over the graveside of your mother and father come back or i'll hurt you at this point of course we know the big payoff for this is going to be kane at this point did you already have kane mapped out and did you know it would be glenn jacobs yeah oh yeah we that, that, that role was tailor made for Glenn. It was made for Glenn. You know, I, I saw Glenn when I was doing some work in uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling for Jim Cornette's uh, group. That was, was always a lot of fun. Uh, and I uh, didn't make a lot of money there, but I sure as hell had a lot of fun doing it uh, and traveling the Smoky, Smoky Mountain roads uh, once every s- several weeks to do TV. But Glenn was perfect for that role. You know, he was a unibomber for, for Cornette. Big athletic, intelligent guy. Of course, he's the mayor of Knox County, Tennessee now, and he's doing a great job. He's, he's, but he was a, he was a keeper. He was a. I brought him. I think is I brought him to a TV. I believe in either Augusta or Macon or something like that, uh, and for WWE taping. And everybody loved him. He was polite, well spoken, intelligent, and it didn't hurt that he was six uh, ten and three hundred pounds. So uh, yeah, he, that role was his. So at this point, are you guys like drawing sketches in the art department of what it will look like? Or do you already have all that mapped out? You're just letting the storyline play out. Cause it shows a lot of patience here. No, we, we signed him not knowing that that would be his, his final, final role, you know, because he did, he did the, uh, the crazy diesel thing and he did uh, Dr. Yankum. And so finally you, you, you're looking around and you, you're scratching your head. Are you, are you kidding me? We can't find something viable this big dude to do dr yankum's never going to draw any that's sometimes gimmicks are given to talents and, and they're and they're just cal- they're, they're they're career killers you, you can't get over this gimmick to the point of being a main event guy and people say that there'll be a critics of, of ours or mine well jr you know you can get anybody over and they could all draw on top if it's done right if it's done right okay good for you well you should start your own company do everything right and you'll make a lot of money it's not that easy. So, uh, finally, but Glenn, if you, you know, looking at Glenn Kane and undertaker, they were, they're both this, almost identical in size. Maybe, you know, uh, a little here, a little that, but essentially you could, you could, fit, you could pass his brothers. Hello. That's what we did. So, uh, that's how that worked. But the art department got on the, I know there's a lot of work with the mask, uh, being done because his face was allegedly burnt and all that stuff. It's a good story. And, uh, I'm, I'm very privileged to say that I think Glenn had two masks left and he gave me one of one of my restaurants. I still got it. It's pretty cool. That is cool. Yep. Let's talk about Farouk. He's going to be a big player on this pay-per-view. You're positioning him for a world title shot and you sort of start to set the tone when he's in the ring being interviewed by Vince McMahon. And he's talking about how, you know, there's never been a black man to wear the WWF world title. And there's only been token intercontinental champions like Ahmed Johnson. And he even makes the comment to Vince. He says something like, you don't feel a black man is worthy of being champion of the WWF, but you do think a black man is worthy of washing your car. And he called the undertaker, your white savior. And he says, we're, we are no longer sitting back and we're going to, you know, get what we want by any means necessary. So this militant stance and maybe teetering on controversy when you're talking about, well, there's never been a black champion, just token champions. Is that, is that Vince Russo pushing for that? Is that Vince McMahon pushing for that? It does feel like a slippery slope creatively. It is. It was a slippery slope. It was edgy. It was TV 14 material. And in today's world, it would not be probably accepted because of the racial overtones of the, of the topic. At that time in that era, 1997, uh, a little bit different public climate. It was in the process of, of a of a fictional presentation. Of course, we all knew that Farouk was Ron Simmons, four-time All. And I even said that on that broadcast. You know, he was a legit four-time football All-American at Florida State. He was a beast as a nose tackle. So uh, uh, we you couldn't do that today, as we all know. But then. It seemed to work and everybody was on the same page. You know, Ron had no issues saying it because uh, quite frankly, 
the one of the great things that makes one of the things that makes heels great Conrad is when they tell you the truth and you don't want to hear it. Right. And that's what he did. So, uh, and then of course, takers, taker was, uh, and, and Ron and all those cats in the, in the nation were taker guys, uh, friends, you know, buddies, whatever. So, uh, and, and Vince wanted to be edgier. So I don't know if it was a Russo just flipped the switch and there it came. It was a combined effort, but uh, certainly it would not be fair to Russo, uh, to say that, uh, it, that it, that his creativity didn't contribute to that type of presentation. One of the other things I wanted to talk about on this show is Rob Van Dam, while he's still working for ECW has a match on this same episode of raw and it's against Jeff Hardy. Now this is before we know the Hardy boys. He's Jeff's here working as an independent, as a, as an underneath, as an enhancement worker, whatever you prefer. And Rob Van Dam is positioning himself as like a trader from ECW. Who's now competing on Monday night raw. And Jerry Lawler is using this to advance his angle, which will ultimately pay off at hardcore heaven uh, with a match on an ECW pay-per-view against Tommy dreamer, where he's saying that this is extremely crappy wrestling and that ECW can't compete with the talents of Rob Van Dam. So he's done there. And now he's Mr. Monday night. Uh, tell us how this came to be, because at the time, this is pretty groundbreaking that you have another promotion featuring their talent on Monday night raw. Well, it is, uh, the, uh, the, one of the things behind the scenes that some people know is that the WWF at the time was subsidizing ECW and, and helping them keep their doors open. Um, uh, and we, that, cause that I, I know that to be a fact, it's not hearsay cause it came out of my budget in the town in the town relations side. So, uh, and our, that was several reasons. You know, I, I think Vince actually liked Paul. I certainly did. Uh, he was, we knew he was a bright mind. He was there. If we ever needed something somewhere down the road, uh, he was an asset that we wanted to at least, uh, you know, covet to some degree. But the other thing is, is that we also knew that, uh, ECW has some really good talents that, uh, and so many of them are Northeastern guys that they grew up with a WWWF, uh, background and DNA. So they would be a good fit for us because they would want to come to our company. We thought, and they did. So there's a lot of reasons to do that and it helps keep the business alive and all, all kinds of the right reasons. So that was kind of a part of that deal. It wasn't like it was a, a screw job on Paul or anything, you know, it was all planned out. And, uh, but I, I thought Rob Van Dam, I still do. I think he's one of the best performers we ever had. Uh, he can do things that, uh, that were so far ahead of their time. He's so innovative and creative and, and unique. And the thing a lot of people don't realize about Rob and you kind of talk about uh, how tough he is, um, and this, the, his movie he did not too long ago, uh, a little documentary was really good. Uh, he talked about his concussions. Uh, this son of a gun worked hurt a lot and he was tougher than a $2 steak without a doubt. So Rob Van Dam was always high on my list of, uh, of talents. And I'm glad that we got him. You know, it was, he, he had a Rob Van Dam had that, uh, that ability, that inherent ability, which is a blessing in this business to connect with his audience because he was being himself, not unlike Steve Austin was being himself or, you know, Shawn Michaels being himself or, or Bret Hart. Rob Van Dam was an enhanced version of Rob, Rob Van Dam. And, uh, people could get that. They were, they didn't think they were being worked. So, uh, he was a big time player. Jeff was so young about that time. I'm guessing Conrad, Jeff was a, he might've been 17, maybe 18. Uh, he and Matt both, uh, maybe fibbed on their age. when we, when we used them, I brought them in a lot to do TVs. Uh, I, I liked them. Their dad was a mail carrier, single dad. And I loved the, their story and the fact they made their own wrestling gear and their big time marks, just like me. Uh, I always had time for the heart. He still do, but Jeff was, you could tell Jeff was going to be something special because he too connected with the audience and he had that great face and the great body English and, uh, and athleticism. So, you know, looking before us right there, uh, we had two guys in the ring again, going back to that Al Snow story earlier about wanting to get guys who could work with anybody and make guys better for a guy like Jeff Hardy to get better. He needed to work with guys like Al Snow, for example, but, uh, he and Rob VD had a, that was a nice night and 
and Rob got his win and the people connected with Mr. Monday night and they stayed connected for a long time. Let's talk about the Dustin Rhodes interview that aired here. This era of 97 is a little weird in that you guys are doing like sit down interviews with different talent later in the summer. You're going to do this with Mick Foley. Of course, he'll be in character as mankind, but that's when we'll first learn about dude love and all that. But here we're doing it with Dustin Rhodes and, uh, it's a pretty emotional interview and he's talking about his relationship with his dad, where he's saying, you know, all those years I looked up to you and you were bigger than life. I wanted to be just like you. And there's no one on the planet who can do gold dust as well as I can. And I hope you're proud of me and myself and my family. And I love you, dad, but they weren't really talking at the time. They'd had a real life falling out. Whose idea was it to, Hey, let's, let's put that on TV. I, I'm assuming it's Vince's idea. Uh, we, we started getting this more reality based television storylines and that was a good one, uh, for all the right reasons. You know, Dusty's a world famous hall of fame guy. And, uh, everybody had yeah, great name identity and, you know, he, the father son thing was not a work it's real. So, uh, we were kind of, kind of, uh, fading toward that era of presentation, which is still work. will still work today. Quite frankly, uh, reality based much like, uh, well, again, we saw Cody and, and you saw the match finally of Cody and, and Dustin from, uh, double or nothing. And they had one hell of a match. I thought. You know, I'm sure you enjoyed it for as old school wrestling fan. How can you not like that match? Right. So it was good stuff. And, uh, uh, but Vince, that was a Vince deal. Anything that was on TV, Vince either created it or approved it. It didn't nothing passes nothing. Oh, when we started to do that, nothing, not that never happened. Uh, at least in that era, it did not happen. So, uh, but it was, it's just reality. And we were trying to figure out if Dustin was going to be a baby face or a heel. I, I, my point all, was always in this thing that whether we tried it or not, we can't, I don't think we should have ever tried to do something that would, uh, you know, the homophobia, the backlash of, of, of the negativity of him being a heel. Oh, it's not good. Why would you, why do you dislike him? Because he may be gay. He may be bisexual. You know, again, you know, you asked me this one on one broadcast, but I didn't know what androgynous was. So I'd sit on TV probably. Right. But you know, but. So we didn't want to go with sexual route wholeheartedly, but it was always going to be there. It's one of those deals where you say, that'd be like me saying, uh, well, here comes Ahmed Johnson, man, what an African-American he is. Right. Well, I can kind of see that JR. I mean, he's not, he's a black man. Okay. So things like that go without saying, it's like saying Andre's tall. Okay. Good job. So, so that, that's kind of where we are on that deal. But uh, uh, Dustin had a story to tell and he wanted to tell it. Okay. And that's I think what I want to get a, to. I think that might be a way Conrad for him to, to make up some lost time. And thankfully, thankfully at the end of the day, uh, that all happened. When did you guys shoot that? Is that shot in Stanford? Is that shot on location and how far out in advance did you guys discuss what you would talk about? Was, was there anything as you're going through that where he's like, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about that. Or did you just tape for a long time and then just chop it up and post? Yeah, we, we kept, we just talked. And, and edited what we needed and what we wanted. And so that way you don't eliminate nothing. Uh, you don't stifle any creativity, uh, in the, in a creative process, there's no bad ideas. Obviously some are much, much better than others. So you just, you let the guy talk, you hit your, as an interviewer, you're prepared to ask the questions and you know, uh, you know, the story. So, uh, but no, we didn't rehearse it. It wasn't rehearsed. The best, you kind of go over what you're going to talk about from, you know, we're going to try to start here. We're going to try to go to here. And this is what we're going to, we want to make these points in between. And uh, then you do it naturally or as organically as you can. And that's kind of what we did there with the dust interview. And it worked out well. It was a nice interview. We finished this episode of raw with the heart foundation coming to the ring. Brett's going to tell bulldog anvil, Owen and Pillman to return to the dressing room. And then he calls out the gutless little poser, Sean Michaels and tells him to get us out, get his ass out here. He cuts a promo here saying that it finally dawned on me the arrogance and attitude and cockiness that is in you is what all these Americans represent. And you think you're better than everybody and you look down on us and he compares America to the Roman empire. And he says, it's going to fall because of scum like Shawn Michaels. And he starts to list things like, um, instead of trying to face him like a man, 
you're too busy posing for girly magazines and putting tattoos on yourself and earrings in your navel and nose and ears and shaking your ass and making yourself look like a horse's ass. And he said, you know, Sean Michaels, the biggest thing that bothers me is you didn't have the guts to face me at WrestleMania this year. One-on-one chat me up this promo. How much of this, you know, we hear these days that everybody's given a script. How much of this is just Brett riffing? How much of this is bullet points and what, if any of it was approved ahead of time? Uh, I would say based on my experience there, especially during that tumultuous era, uh, Brett was going to say what Brett wanted to say. And, uh, and Vince is going to let him by and large, not that that's an indictment on either side. Uh, so my point is that Brett created the interview. He knew what he wanted to say. He was going to take it in a direction that, that, uh, it would make him and his boys, uh, heart foundation heels in North in America and massive, massive baby faces in Canada and the UK anywhere that, uh, it, you know, it, we find out Conrad, when you travel, Americans are not loved by everybody. Right. S- sorry to mention that folks, but you know, we're, because we are somewhat arrogant, uh, conceited bastards sometimes, no doubt. And, uh, you could, so Americans aren't love. You could tell that by how Trump was treated in, in England, the big protests and people surely got better things to do than protest Donald Trump being in their city, but they seemed like they did. So, uh, Brett, uh, they were smart. So in, in the, in the, in the, in the lower, lower 48, so to speak, they're going to be heels. Didn't have a problem with that. You get an ass over 18 inches, you make more money outside the U S they're going to be baby faces because they are saying the truth about what many, how many Americans are. So it worked out pretty well, but that's a bread interview there all, all the way around. And it certainly was not written. He certainly did not memorize it. Now I'm sure that as any good performer will do, he'll have bullet points. He'll either write them down himself, which most will do just to have a, some sort of rule of thumb or direction, or he will just make mental notes. If you're that, uh, if you're that good. And, uh, but you gotta have some structure, but I don't think it was written at all. And I don't think he's memorized it. I think it came from his heart. He followed the direction of where they were going in their story and where he was going with the heart foundation. But, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a riveting promo way ahead of his time. I thought, well, Sean Michaels disagrees because the idea is Brett's supposed to stand up out of his wheelchair and Sean's going to super kick him. And then the show goes off the air, but Brett keeps talking. And then when he, by the time he finally stands up and gets the super kick, the show's off the air, they've already missed it. And Brett wrote about this and he says the fan noise was so loud that he couldn't hear his cue. Mm -hmm. And instead of the show ending the way it was supposed to, it ended with him still berating Sean and Sean just standing there and doing nothing about it. And Sean backstage thinks he's done it on purpose and is furious. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you remember about the backstage temperament when Sean comes back and realizes, Hey, none of that shit made air. Well, I was out front, so I didn't, I didn't lay up my eyes, see it with my own eyes. So I heard enough about it again, wrestlers and people that, uh, agents and guys, those, those guys are in talent relations uh, side of my, my world. Couldn't wait to come tell me everything, you know, and embellish course, uh, Sean thought it was a screw job. He'd been set up, but, uh, I am a firm believer to this very day. That was not the case. Uh, I, I do. I know it was noisy. Brett, uh, was all Brett was very believable on the mic and did some great promos from time to time without a doubt. But to say that his promos for the strength of his game would not be accurate because with the strength of his game was wrestling bell to bell, in my opinion. So he missed his cue, uh, and he didn't get, he didn't get his last line in apparently that he wanted to get in. And, uh, so they, they always have to have a cue. So tell me when you're going to do this or tell me when you're going to do that. What's your last line. And so they worked that out. He worked that out with a truck or through the gorilla position. He didn't get there and then we went off the air, but you know, it aired the next week. So it wasn't like it was a, oh my God, we lost it forever. But I never believed that Brett would sabotage the angle. Uh, it's just not his style. It really isn't. But, uh, of course he was made to look like the bad guy. And, and Sean had a lot of people I'm sure in his ear, uh, chirping that, you know, Brett just screwed you. 
And, and you know, are you guys that stupid? You know, the camera's rolling. We got this, we got this kick. In the, you kicked him right out of the wheelchair. It was a great move. It was a great heel move. Or a baby face move in the States, I guess, but it certainly made Sean a heel everywhere else. So uh, I, I never thought that was a conspiracy. I just thought it was oversight, human error, quite frankly. It's not as exotic a story to tell, but uh, I think that's what happened. Yeah. Style that maybe some friends are in his ear, uh, his ear being Sean, uh, trying to get him riled up. And as a result, the next week, Sean shows up at Raw in Mobile. And according to the observer appears to be in no condition to perform, uh, when he was on TV, he's slurring his words badly and makes a remark that Brett was having some sunny days. And that of course is something everybody starts talking about. Um, when did you realize, Hey, this is a, this is a problem. When he started talking, you know, he sounded like he was, you know, he was slurring. You know, so he either was extremely fatigued or he was, he was medicated. I sensed the latter and, uh, but that was part of these issues. You know, he was not, Sean was in a very, uh, dark place at that point in time in his life for whatever reason. And there's probably plenty of good reasons, but the bottom line was he was not conducting himself as he does today. And he, he needed, he needed to change to something, obviously a better lifestyle would have been one thing, but, uh, he, uh, I don't know. I, I just, I felt bad for him. You know, I love this kid. I, I, I went down to San Antonio and talking to come back into business after he'd been gone four years. It took him four years to get over his issues. Basically he bad back medicines, maybe some booze, you know, attitude, big time attitude issues, personal life. But you know, uh, it was, it was just sad to see where he was headed because if he had not, and look, you got to give McMahon credit too. Sean's making 750 grand a year. Now you do that, divide that by 52 and you get how much he's making a week. It's pretty good money. He got that check every week, uh, every day, every week of every year that he was under contract. And while he was sitting at home in San Antonio, didn't have to happen. But that's how Vince did it. And he like Vince always had a soft spot for Sean because he saw Sean's uh, rebellious anti-establishment attitude as reminiscent of a young Vince. And now he had to navigate the uh, waters of the old WWWF when, when his dad owned it. And so I think there's something to be said about that. So Sean was, uh, he, he was, he was, he was really, uh, going down a real bad road. And luckily changed his direction before it got too late. Let's, uh, before we get down the rabbit hole of what happened next, uh, I guess we should talk about the, the climate in wrestling at the time, because it does feel like you guys start to get a little bit more attention in the mainstream media. The Baltimore sun, for example, is talking about how, um, since the WWF is playing catch up ball, it feels like they're countering with sex, violence, crude language, and blood. Would you disagree with that? Uh, well, it's no, I wouldn't totally disagree with it because it's not totally untrue. Uh, the choice of you know, violence is controlled violence. So I don't know. It's not the traditional violence. Those are Kevin Eck. Uh, I actually went to work uh, for WWE not too, you know, in, after that. Uh, and, and the creator decide and he does a lot of work now for Danny McDevitt in the uh, Maryland championship wrestling, smart guy. Uh, but the language is always, you know, kind of a, always kind of some of that language that you use in describing it crude language. Okay. This far was crude. Uh, blood is not new. Uh, but yeah, we, we went to some extremes. We got a little bit, you know, we got, uh, more physical with boys started working a little bit more intense. Uh, it was a good physical style. And sometimes you have, you know, broken noses and things of that nature that come along, but no, I don't think Kevin's totally wrong on that. I might not use the same words, but the bottom line is they meant the same. So yeah, he's, he's pretty much spot on. Let's keep it moving here and talk about Michinoku pro wrestling. You guys are trying to work a deal out here. According to the observer, uh, he's saying there's nothing new on the relations with AAA. It looks like you guys had a pretty successful event at Royal rumble, but 
now maybe it doesn't feel like there's going to be anything progress there. Talk to us a little bit about the relationship with Michinoku Pro and AAA and how all of a sudden those became a thing where for years and years, it almost felt like the WWF ignored everybody. Well, we had to start rethinking everything, Conrad. And that's, uh, you know, sometimes any business, uh, you have to you have step back and re- reevaluate hit the reset button to some degree in some areas of what you're doing. Uh, we believe that our brand was going to be very global. We want to get more diversity on it. Uh, we wanted to do some, uh, uh, more work and uh, develop a junior heavyweight, light heavyweight, whatever cruiserweight, whatever word you want to give it, uh, division. And we knew that there are a lot of really good young talents out there, uh, that were not giants that we could, could be very entertaining on our television programming. So that's the, and Victor Quinones, who was a real close to girl of monsoon back in the day in, in Puerto Rico and so forth. Uh, Victor is, was our, uh, liaison, uh, between AAA and, uh, Mitch Noku pro. So that's when we brought in Kai and Ty, those four fellas, Helen, uh, uh, I'm trying to, trying to think of his name. I see it's a uh, show Fanaki hasn't left yet. He's still here in the States. I think he's, he's trying to be a citizen by now, for God's sakes. Uh, uh, I know he's a big Dallas and he's a green Bay Packer fan. You can see that on, on Facebook. Uh, so those guys, we just depth. We got some new talents, could do some new things with them. And of course, uh, in our, uh, stupid society, because everybody certainly vividly remembers December 7th, 1941, all the Asians were in or villains in that era, which is kind of hilarious. When you start to think about it, sad, sad hilarity, but nonetheless, uh, that's why we got it. We're going to expand our roster. Uh, add some Japanese element, get some guys that have a little different style and uh, Victor brokered that deal. So we brought those four cats in and, uh, one of the best names of all, one of the best wrestling names ever, Dick to go. <laughs> Dick to go, Dick uh, to go. You know what? I, I feel like now is a good time to remind everybody that if you'd like a little more Dick to go, you need to check out our friends over at bluechew.com. I knew uh, you were going to go there. You son of a gun. <laughs> what a say- what a segue artist I am. Well, you're good at it, my friend. And <laughs> yeah. you're good at more than one thing now, thanks to Blue Chew. Your, your performance in the bedroom has been upped, Mr. Ross. And yeah. uh, that's because BlueChew.com has provided us with the world's first chewables with the same active ingredients as both Viagra and Cialis. And these chewables can work faster than pills, even up to twice as fast. And the chewables from BlueChew.com can be taken on a full or an empty stomach. The online physician consult is free. It's cheaper than those other two. It only takes a few minutes to connect with one of their physicians. And if you qualify, you get prescribed online very quickly. There's no in-person doctor visit, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at a pharmacy. It ships directly to your door in discreet packaging. And the chewables from bluechew.com are prescribed online by a doctor and made in the USA. Uh, So bluechew is going to give you the confidence to chew it and do it. You and your partner are going to love it. And, uh, you've got a special offer for them, JR. If you're listening right now and you haven't already, go see what everybody in wrestling is talking about. This thing is sweeping the nation. It's in every locker room in the wrestling world. Bluetooth.com is the place to go. And you can get a cr- an incredible deal when you use our promo code JR. What you're going to get is your first shipment for free. Yes, sir. I, I can't, I can't. I mean, why would you not? It's free. All you've got to do is pay the $5 shipping. And our promo code is JR. Of course, Blue Chew is B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W.com, BlueChew.com, and use that promo code. And Jim, you were kind of skeptical of this at first, but you're a believer now, aren't you? Well, yes, it works. Bottom line, folks, it works. I know that some of you are uncomfortable uh, hearing Conrad Conrad and I talk about this topic. But sometimes, uh, and we don't mean to make you uncomfortable, but this is a fact. It's a reality of life. Uh, and it adds, it adds a lot. It adds confidence a, a lot among other things too. Uh, you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm ready for this journey. Uh, and I just think that, uh, it's worth a try. If you're, I know here's I'm put it this way. There are wrestling couples where the female of the side of the, of the group with the equation is making sure her partner has Bluetooth. And these are younger, healthy guys that want to just a little bit extra gas. So all I'm saying, Conrad and I, are, we, we joke about it. This product really does work. And so anybody that, anybody that talks about it generally says, well, I don't have that problem. Exactly. You don't have to have it. 
the, an ED problem. This is going to make things better. Uh, and it has to certainly, I can only attest to how it works for me and it works very well. Check it out. Bluetooth.com. Use that promo code JR. Yes, sir. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your good friend, Paul bear. Mm-hmm. He's no longer with us, but May 17th, he is featured in his hometown newspaper, the mobile register, and they're putting him over huge. Um, and talking a little bit about his background in wrestling. I don't know that we have spent enough time in wrestling, really talking about who Paul bear really was before we just sort of keep it moving here. I just wanted to give you a minute to sort of talk about the man behind the character. Big George Jones fan, biggest George Jones fan in the world. Uh, uh, I, uh, somebody on one of the big, big, big ribs one time was somebody went, might've been Owen went to uh, him and said, uh, that he just heard that George Jones had, had been killed in a car wreck. And, uh, he didn't realize how serious that no, that information was to Paul bear. It was devastating. And so the rib really blew up in the wrong way. And, and. Owen had to apologize and I'm only kidding. And I don't know if Paul Bear ever forgave him, uh, to, to give him that rib about George Jones. He was a real mortician. He was an air force veteran, uh, United States air force. Uh, he was not always 300 pounds. He did some wrestling. He did some managing, you know, and he was a regular on the weekly uh, shows there in the, in mobile in that old territory. He worked a lot in Dallas for Fritz went to the Von Ericks. He uh, worked for my friend Dennis Brent for some, uh, sometimes and Dennis's company as well. Just a really good dude, man. He, lo- he is a great historian, dearly loved the business and getting to be that play that mortician, uh, which he really was, uh, it with undertaker was a match made in heaven. It, it really was. He was just a super guy. And, and uh, I remember we, I paid for our, our, my budget. I didn't pay for, you know what I mean? I, out of my budget for that, uh, gastric surgery to help him lose weight because he was going to just, you know, wasn't going to be a long life. And we, I think we extended his life, you know, but not long enough, obviously he left us too early, but we give the, we did the, uh, the uh, surgery, uh, the lap band thing or whatever the hell it was. I don't remember exactly the name of the procedure, but to help him lose some weight, it kind of resurrected his career a little bit because he'd gotten so heavy. It was just, he was just, his health was just going to hell and, uh, just a, but a sweetheart of a guy, Conrad, really good guy, a credit to the business without a doubt. One of the best. And I hope we get to talk about him long form sometime. If you guys are into it, we'll try to make it happen. Let's talk about the May 19th raw. You know, we, we briefly talked about, you know, the whole sunny days promo and, and that really, uh, sort of takes over the show and it becomes what everybody is talking about. Did did you think that, um, you know, it's weird because I don't think anybody knew how this would shake out. Obviously nobody could have predicted Montreal, but with Brett and, and, and him being injured, did you think any part of you think, cause the original plan, if I have this correct, was that Brett and Sean were going to do something at King of the ring. And then when Brett's injured, that changes. And so they pivot and we're going to talk about what they did. Did you think at all that maybe Brett, I don't know, was sandbagging. Maybe he could go, but didn't want to and thought maybe now's not the time, or I don't want to go in there against a guy I don't really trust and not be at my best. I'm not saying that he was faking the injury, but maybe if it was somebody else, he would have tried to power through, but because it's Sean, he doesn't want anybody saying, oh, Brett gave me a bad match or whatever. No, I think that, uh, I think that Brett would not have taken that route if he was hundred percent healthy. Uh, cause to me, he was very mentally tough, you know, very mentally tough. Uh, and, and he would not have backed away from the challenge and it was a challenge for Brett to deal with Sean and Sean to deal with Brett and for them to coexist as professionals. It was challenging. Everybody knows it was challenging. We know they had fights. We know that they had the thing in Montreal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, they, they, they had a legitimate rivalry. They, you know, they apparently at the end of the day, just, just despised each other. So, but I never thought Brett would walk away and upset the, uh, uh, the, 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 the company and the plans of the company to, to draw money, which everybody in his locker room shared in 
I didn't think he was that kind of guy. And I still don't think he's that kind of guy. So I, again, I don't believe in the, the Bret Hart conspiracy that he, uh, you know, plotted to sabotage the angle. Just, I can't, I'm not going to buy that one. Let's keep it moving here. And you do a sit down in this next episode where you're sitting down with mankind and you're talking about him growing up and the whole play to worms. Is this done the same way with gold dust? And, and why was the decision made to say, Hey, you know what? These gold dust ones went well, let's do it now for Foley. Why was he the right guy to go to next with this format? Mick had a great story to tell and we had footage, he had unique footage. We had that footage I mentioned earlier about. Uh, Snooker come off the cage in Madison Square Garden. We had footage of Mick uh, wrestling as a teenager and jumping off his, I think, the roof of his house or something into a mattress. Uh, we had some classic old footage that told, uh, helped tell our story. And Mick was an b- amazing storyteller. This is before he'd written any of his books. And I, I, I think that some of the mot- motive, motivation, I should say, for him to write that first book was, uh, came out of some of those interviews that we did because they got over so big, him just telling stories of his life, you know, the story about playing lacrosse without a cup and getting hit, in the, hit getting hit in the gonads with the lacrosse ball or whatever the hell they are. And, and, uh, you know, he just, uh, he, he, this is funny guy and his stories are real and they're relatable. So, you know, like he said, the only time that girls ever noticed his groin was his, his testicles are the size of grapefruits and, uh, from that injury. So, uh, but he just had a great story to tell Conrad and, and, and we needed to tell that story because we didn't really know if Mick was going to be fish or foul. His story down there made him a baby face because he could, fans could relate to almost every step of his journey. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't need him to be a baby face in the early, early going. We needed him to be able to, a guy that we could put with undertaker. That was the, why that's why I hired him. Uh, undertaker needed heels and mix six, four and 300 pounds. And he could match up well. And, and, and they, and both those guys liked each other from previous uh, territories in Dallas and in Atlanta. So that was a deal. He just had a great story to tell. And we felt like we were compelled to tell it and we had no script. Uh, we did that in a little studio, uh, at, on uh, 120 Hamilton in Stanford, I had a crew there. And I noticed that as the night progressed, we did it after work as the night progressed, we had more and more people hanging around that, that usually meant one of two things. One, they're waiting on some really good catering or, uh, they are really enthralled in what they're hearing. And so then all of a sudden we're doing this, uh, this interview, or I think we get to a point to take a break, a pee break or something, maybe to eat. I'm not sure. And all of a sudden I hear Vince's voice from the, in the darkness. Cause you know, the lights are on us. We can't see past the lights. And, uh, I remember what he said, you know, he, he, he was, he put it over like, you know, down, this is good shit, boys. It's good shit. You know, something like that. And, uh, that was a, what's for a guy like Mick and myself. That was great validation. He couldn't have said anything better. And he never, and he never, interjected his creativity. He never told us what to say. He never told us to those guys what to edit out. He just let it roll. So we just had that long conversation. The only thing we knew we were going to do at the end was I was going to get the mandible claw. And my, my only thought process was I going to get the shooting mandible claw or the working mandible claw. You know what the difference is Conrad? I don't. All right. The shooting mandible claws where they put, he puts your two, his two fingers in your mouth under your tongue and squeezes with his thumb under your chin. The working mandible claw is where he takes those same two fingers and bends them over in half. And it looks like they're in your mouth, but they're not. Luckily for me, I got the working mandible claw. I think (laughs) that's awesome. Yeah. But, uh, that's how we we were going to end it, but that's how we struck constructed our interview. That's why so many fans are saying it's going to be great for AEW because they're not going to, they're not going to have writers to write these promos, these guys and tell them what to say. Uh, they're going to let the talent say what they want as long as it's got some sort of structure as I E L outline of, of, of bullet points. That's what it's going to be. So that's great. But that, that interview was not written by anybody, no writers, no creative people were involved in it. Uh, the, uh, in that respect, respect, it was just Mick and I, now everybody knew what the story we were going to tell, but, uh, you know, nobody wrote, wrote a script. I was trying to say, there's no teleprompter, no nothing like that. So we had a, it just clicked. I had good chemistry with Mick. 
I, I, I believed in his story. I knew his story thoroughly. You know, I had to go to the wall to hire him. And, and all of a sudden, you know, Vince standing there and saying, this is good shit. Uh, I think it also gave Mick a great deal of confidence that, uh, Vince finally recognized that Mick Foley had a lot of talent. Let's keep it moving here because I, I want to move on from the interview, but I, I feel like I have to ask when you're, when you're telling the sympathetic story about, you know, the kids were making me worms and all that, but then you, you, you finish with, and that makes you feel like, okay, he's going to be a sympathetic baby face. We're going to turn him baby face. But then he puts the mandible claw on good old Jr. <laughs> this is not traditional wrestling. This is shades of gray. It's not just standard good guys and bad guys. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a real story and it just showed his unpredictability that sometimes he had urges, aggressive urges that could not be controlled, that he could not restrain himself from, uh, perpetrating. That's kind of how we looked at that thing. And so he's always got that unpredictable uh, aura about him. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where we are. And of course we knew that, uh, nobody wanted to be a, a star of WWE more than Mick Foley for God's sakes. And apparently he would do anything, uh, to achieve that goal because he's done everything to get here, including lose a half a year and, you know, his head's all scarred up and, you know, arms are scarred and he's walking crooked, crooked and, you know, all that good stuff, losing teeth. He's paid a lot of prices is obvious by this, the phys this physical appearance. So you kind of wanted, we just told the whole story and then you let the audience decide if they like him or I don't know. I don't know if I like this guy or not. I don't know if I can trust him or not. So we just let it, let it play out and, and let, then you let the audience just make their own call. Did you like it? Or did you not like it? Is he a baby face? Is he a heel? And the audience should be able to decide that themselves. We should mention here, um, because I do want to put a bow on this Brett thing for a minute. Um, after the sunny days comment, you know, he talks about in his book, how, you know, Julie, his wife and Stu are upset. Uh, and then people at school are starting to sort of mess with his kids a little bit about the sunny days comment. And you have to call and apologize. And as a result, Brett would write in his book. Throughout that week, I brooded about what to do. I wondered about beating the hell out of Sean for real at the pay-per-view, but that could be costly to the company if he got badly hurt and I had to be careful of my knee. I decided to tell Vince that I had to pull out of the pay-per-view because my knee wasn't ready and Vince already had a plan. Stone Cold would catch me alone, flatten me and bash the hell out of me, taking me out of the pay-per-view storyline. And that would be a clean win for Sean or, or and what would have been a clean win for Sean. We should remember that Brent had this arthroscopic knee surgery done on April 23rd. And we've set a stipulation here on this episode of Monday night raw on the 19th, that if he doesn't beat Sean in 10 minutes, he'll never wrestle in the United States again. So it's over. Did you think at that point we may never get this match? These guys are so sideways with each other. Or did you think eventually it would happen? Oh, I thought eventually it definitely would happen without a doubt. I, too much work had been had gone into it. They both knew that, uh, the one thing about that override their personal issues, Conrad is from a professional standpoint, ego standpoint, uh, is that they love having great matches and nobody can deny that when those two cats were on with each other, uh, they made great ma ma magic, great music, no doubt. So yeah, I thought it would eventually happen. I just didn't know when or where, or what shape it's going to take, but there's too much invested. Uh, to not make it happen. And, uh, I knew that Brett was going to do all he could to, to get that stuff rolling, get back in the ring. He decided to restrain himself as best he could from doing what he said he was going to do. And that was beat up Sean because, you know, Sean had crossed the line in the family thing, you know, uh, and that was not good and it embarrassed Brett and his family. And that was certainly not cool. And so it got just another log on the fire, man. It's another log on the fire. But I did think at the end of the day we would finally get to see some sort of conclusion to the storyline because both guys are too old school, too much of a traditionalist to let the angle just evaporate and go away without a conclusion. Let's keep it moving here. Uh, I guess we should mention that raw did a 3.6. Uh, it's the highest rating of the year for raw. W when, when, a, when a rating comes in like that, maybe it doesn't win, but it's the highest rating of the year for you guys. You got to feel like, okay, we're doing something right. Right. Or is it, is it high fives all around or is it just business as usual? Well, there's some, some, uh, obviously 
minuscule celebrating that we had a, we had our best number uh, in a while. Uh, but you know, golly, it, it, you know, you're you're just. I used to tell people this all the time. You know, I, I they said, "Do you get do you get depressed in those 83 weeks that Bischoff's crew beat your ass?" And I said, "No, not really. I didn't have time to get depressed because I had work to do, and we had a, and you know, and some days we had another show to do that week or another pay per view to do that week, whatever. So there was no time for celebrating and no time for uh, you know boo hooing it. But yeah, there was some. Hey, we, we, we thought we were on to something, Conrad, with the reality-based storytelling. Reality-based storytelling that the fans could actually sink their teeth into and not have to uh, uh, try to buy a, you know, some silly character that's, uh, that was all it was is a comedic thing and an eye roller. So we thought we were on to something trend-wise that we should continue to travel. This road should be uh, reality-based, and we did that as best we could. And, and uh, the talents were... The talents that we had at that time were perfect for that scenario. And they loved living those stories out and em- embellishing on the reality of their lives and their issues. It's a, uh, it's a fun time to be a wrestling fan. Um, when you, how do you find out that the match with Sean and Brett is off? And what do you think of the, uh, the pivot to do Sean and Austin? Well, uh, Vince told me. After Sean talked, or excuse me, Brett talked to Sean. Oh, shit. Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. That after uh, Brett had his conversation with uh, Vince, of course, you know, when, I'm sure within the minutes of Vince hanging up the phone, uh, that he had me in his office and uh, he had an idea, you know, he said, well, I'm going to go with Austin. And, and that to me was magic because I, I was an Austin mark, I, I still am. Steve's a good friend, still is. I just saw something and felt something that I had not seen replicated in years. There was one time, one period of time in Louisiana, in the Mid-South Territory, where JYD was white hot. And he could do no wrong. And he sold massive amounts of tickets and so forth. Uh, and then people believed in him. They, they, they seemed to gravitate to him. Black people, white people, men, women, adults, children. I didn't know if the children were going to be too crazy about Austin because of his demeanor. But boy, the guys, our, our primary demo of males, 18 to 34 and 18 to 49, loved his ass big time. So uh, when Ben said, I'm going to go with Austin, number one, number one, I knew that Austin and Sean would have a hell of a match. And the fact that uh, it gives Austin some great TV exposure in building that brand of his, that it was the right thing to do. So it was a, it was a good call. It was the best call we could make, quite frankly. And it worked out pretty good for everybody involved. But, uh, I, I just, I think Brett's, Brett's knee was not good. And look, Hey, you like, you, you asked earlier, if Brett was in, if this was somebody else other than Sean and, and it was really a big thing and could, could Brett have worked? Probably he might've been able to work, but I just don't think he sandbagged it. And, and, uh, but it worked out pretty good. That was a, that show, uh, ended up being a pretty damn good pay-per-view. Let's talk about the situation with Shawn Michaels Meltzer. Um, well, he was not kind to Shawn Michaels in this era. He would say, but the situation with Michaels over the past few weeks has gone far deeper than making shoot comments after being told not to slurring his words on live television, wearing a bandana on his head to signify to the television world. He's still best friends with Kevin Nash. Complaining backstage about having to do an interview with, uh, putting Ken Shamrock over, or even walking out on the company the day he was supposed to drop his title and not returning until after the WrestleMania that he was supposed to return the favor from the biggest victory of his career, thereby screwing up nearly one promotion and being a key factor in the show, uh, doing a poor buy rate and the company being down literally millions of dollars in revenue from its biggest show of the year. He says, Meltzer would go on to say that. He is ill-equipped emotionally to handle the spot that he's been given. And that came out again in recent weeks when he became at odds with Vince, when he demanded a new contract, one that would put his pay at the same level as his rival. And of course, we're talking about Bret Hart there. And what McMahon turns down his demands, he gives his notice saying he wants to join his real friends in WCW, but he's got four years left on the deal. So McMahon refuses. Goes back to that Lee Cassidy situation we talked about earlier. 
you, know, you can't let guys go and just walk in their contract when they feel like they want to leave. Did you, uh, did you feel like this feels common? I mean, you can tell just by the way Dave says this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. And then he even says, and I want your take on this, uh, ill-equipped emotionally to handle the spot. His talent has gotten him. Do you agree with that assessment? At that time he was at that time he was because again, you make a lot of decisions under, uh, stress, uh, depression sets in on a lot of things for these performers. Uh, and then you add either drugs and or alcohol abuse, uh, you know, self-medicating prescription meds, all this other crap. Uh, so under those terms, Meltzer was probably right uh, under those circumstances. Now, eventually that would be cleared up and he would be fine as you, you know, he's very valuable to WWE now. Uh, Sean is in the, uh, uh, performance center. Uh, so, but yeah, he, he wasn't ready. He, he, he lost his buddies. It just was a whole slew of things. And again, I don't know how his home life was. I don't think it was great. You know, he had not married, uh, he, he had not married his current wife at that time. I don't believe, uh, which she made a big, big difference in his life. Uh, and luckily for him, cause he wouldn't be, he, we, he, we would be talking about him posthumously. If we, he had not met her in my opinion, and she helped change his life. He had major issues. Now, all that said, he still, along with the Nate, was the, the two best in-ring workers I ever saw. So he stayed, and even when we brought him back after a four-year hiatus, he comes back his first night in, and he's as good as anybody we've got, if not better. So he was special in a lot of ways, but he, he was not nearly – able to handle his issues outside the ring as he was to be able to go bell to bell with anybody. So when you hear, Hey, uh, there's an issue with Brett. I mean, do you hear that from Vince and, and does everybody in the meeting sort of go, Oh fuck, not this again. <sighs> oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't think we all knew that the, the, the possibility of Brett not having the match cause of his injury was there. No, I mean, in terms of with Sean, like Sean wants to be paid like Brett. And oh. It's like, oh, another fucking Sean Michaels is upset about Brett deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's got, it got old. It got old. Well, the other thing is that you, you don't tear up contracts with four years left on them. Right. That's just, that's not bad. That's, that's bad business. And it's not very smart to even ask somebody that question. Uh, uh he's getting, he's making great money. And, you know, of course he's, he's talking to Kevin and Scott and, you know, they're telling them how great things are. They're doing it where they want. They run their own show. They do their own program, which Eric might disagree with. I don't know, but that, you know, they're, you're, they're going to plan a very rosy picture to try, to try to get Sean to come down there with them. And that wasn't going to happen. There was no way in hell. It ain't going to happen for four years. I'll tell you that. So, you know, hold your breath. Don't, or don't hold your breath. Uh, it's written in the, but yeah, you get tired of it. Gets, you get tired of anybody doing that. You know, it's like I said, people think I'm oversimplifying shit. It's always about cash and creative. It was uh, written in the observer that that Sean was making roughly seven fifty, and mm -hmm. that's his downside. And he signed a five year deal after WrestleMania twelve when he won the world title, or maybe right before. But it's a five year deal around WrestleMania twelve, with mm -hmm. a downside of seven fifty. Does that sound like it's in the ballpark? Oh yeah, that's accurate. He right. got seven fifty because, again, I'm I'm uh, that's my budget right at that time. And, and all, as I said earlier, Vince took care of Sean because he's, he felt a kinship to the son of a gun. And he, 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 he loved that, I don't know, his, his demeanor in a lot of, a lot of ways because Vince, it reminded Vince of Vince, when it, young Vince. Uh, so I don't know if that's bragging or complaining. I don't have a clue, but nonetheless, Sean was making seven fifty. He made seven fifty a week for, uh, four years. And all that time he was home, like I said earlier, he was making 750 grand a year. That's a lot of money to not do nothing. <laughs> let's, right? talk, let's talk about something that happened the next week on raw. Uh, this has been something that's floated around on the internet in these last few years. You know, obviously things are different. Times were different. You addressed it earlier when we talked about the racial promo from Farouk, mm -hmm. Jerry Lawler comes out and cuts a promo on gold <laughs> trying to hype their match. And he says something like gold dust, old man, old dust doesn't even love him anymore. Well, I know dusty Rhodes, And he told me why it's because you married the biggest gold digger in Georgia. 
and then yeah. put on a woman's wig and went around kissing men like a flaming F word. And then regarding Dakota Lawler said, you should have named that little brat target because I heard everybody in Atlanta had a shot at it. Oh, that classic. Well, that was not written for him. <laughs> You know, uh, it's, it's, it it's an edgy it, promo, you know, in, in, in the era where, uh, you know, things were over the edge, this got everybody's attention. It is something that you would almost hear on like a roast battle or something like that. It's, there's lots of low blows, but it is making gold dust that sympathetic baby face, which was maybe go. the idea yep. with the interview the previous week. But does anybody say, Hey, uh, I don't know if this is a good idea, obviously talking about old dust. And you know, that's whatever, but then to say the F word and then to reference the child, mm. maybe in hindsight, not the best idea. Maybe, maybe a uh, good point. Uh, it, you got to remember you, the talents when they saw that the blinders are off and the bits are out of their mouth, uh, they were able to run free. Uh, most of them will take it as far as they can. And, uh, Lawler getting the word that, Hey, we want to be a ledge here and you're a heel, blah, blah, blah. People forget how great a heel Jerry Lawler was and an amazing talker. Uh, during that time, I, like I said, I watched the, uh, paper uh, this week. I watched it on Tuesday and, and, uh, you know, his work leading into that, uh, and, and that night was classic. Any young wrestler that's watching, uh, that wants to be a heel. And wants to know fundamental soundness and logic of being a great heel should watch, uh, the events that we're talking about here today and watch how Lawler, uh, navigated that thing. Now he wasn't no young kid at that time. He was a veteran. Didn't, he didn't lose a step. He all, it was all about psychology and positioning. It was as good as you'll see. So it's like a, it's like a clinic on how to be a wrestling heel. Not a bruiser Brody heel or Abdullah the butcher heel, the monster heel. Cause Lawler's not a monster heel. He's a, he's a wrestling heel. And if you get a great example of what a wrestling heel really is, if you watch that show and watch his mannerisms, his timing, he sells differently as a heel than he does as a baby face. He has it down to a science, but he went into business for himself. Could have certainly been argued that it was a little bit too edgy. Uh, and I don't condone talking about children or religion or sexual preferences or, or any of that stuff, uh, politics, or religion, and that stuff don't belong in wrestling to me, but, uh, we didn't have, the, we, we didn't have any rules and he took it as far as he could go. And then you, you tell Vince to tell those guys, well, go see what you got. And let's, then if we got to really in, we'll really in next time. So that's kind of what it was. Let's talk about the, um, the dude love footage, because that's aired in part two of your mankind interview, when did you guys know you had this dude love footage? How does it even come up where you see footage of a young Mick Foley jumping off the roof of his house and cutting promos? I mean, does he say, Hey, I've got this. How does that come about? And Mick provided us the, uh, the, those old home movies. And that's where we discovered dude love and, uh, you know, mix uh, suicidal nature, high risk, you know, high reward type thing. Uh, but Mick provided the home movies and we, we found it's like finding these hidden gems in the NFL, uh, films vault. It was just classic stuff that we we had to use it. We had to figure out a way to use it. And the, and the, and those interviews that uh, Mick and I did was the vehicle that we do. We chose. One of the things that uh, happened on this show and it happened a lot in this era, especially after WrestleMania 13 was we would see Sable modeling stuff where there was an undertaker shirt or an Austin 316 shirt here. She's modeling the inflatable King of the ring chair, <laughs> which is a $59 item plus $11 shipping and handling. Yes, but you guys you were surprised when you would see the ratings come in and holy cow, Sable's popping a number and all she's doing is walking down the ramp in a t-shirt, right? Damn right. And she did it very well. <laughs> she did it very, very well. And of course those t-shirts are always like double mediums or something she wore. Uh, they were very form fitting, shall we say. And, and she had a very nice form for them to fit. Uh, you know, no different. Just like we talked about on the, on the show before Connie, you know, when Vince and I interviewed Mark Merrow and she and his wife, uh, Rena came along with the, for the meeting. And then we go back and he's, he calls me in a few minutes. 
Did you see what I saw? Yeah, I sure did. God damn, God damn, Jr. <laughs> well, so she was she she was just, she had it, man. The sex appeal, the look, the walk, the stature, the eyes, the smile, the little smirk. She knew she was in control, and the great stars. They used to say the same thing about the the original Nature Boy, Buddy Rogers, that he could leave when he left the dressing room and he walked out with that great tan and his nice robes and stuff. And some people would cheer him because he looked like a real pro, but with his sneers and his arrogance and his walk, by the time he got into the ring, they hated him. And that's a true story. And Rena, you could tell she was the same way on the opposite. She walked, walked the aisle, does her, her, her selling jobs or Vanna white. Man, can you imagine her on oh, Vanna White? Vanna White's job would have been in jeopardy if Rena had been coming along in that role. But she did very well. And, and the minute, and that's where the minute by minute ratings, again, influence creative. And I think that's probably a smart thing. The audience has always responded, re, always responded to her. It was documented. So she should be doing something more than modeling a t shirt. Well, I'll tell you a t-shirt, uh, well, it was, was the topic in the office after these mankind promos air, they sit down interviews with you air, uh, Keller would write that the sales on those shirts for mankind go up 300%. Talk about building a baby face, right? Yep. It's I, wanna, I appreciate all that money I got from those shirts. Nothing, <laughs> not a damn thing, no, it, it's, but no, it, it worked. We, that was a part of the whole process of building that, that character is going to be a baby face or a heel. We knew what we wanted to uh, initially, but we knew that we had more because we had three layers. We knew Cactus Jack was a character that Vince didn't want to use in the beginning. So we, we, he, he helped invent mankind with the mask and the whole nine yards. That was Vince's deal. Uh, cause he didn't want to, he wanted to create something new, a WWF version of Mick Foley. And so, uh, then we didn't, then dude love came along in a home movie. So we know we got cactus Jack. Now we got mankind and who's this dude love dude, dude love dude. So, uh, we, we got three guys there. Hell, we got three t-shirts. We've got three main events. We got, you know, we got all kinds of ways to go with this thing. And it established Mick having more, uh, security. So because he had a lot of diversity, he could help us in a lot of ways, baby face, heel, one of three characters. Uh, and he was all so reliable. So it was a good, it was, it was a marriage made in heaven for us. As far as how Mick, uh, evolved in that, in those three roles, we got lucky. Let's keep it moving here. I want to talk about the uh, match where Shawn Michaels is going to team up with Steve Austin. They become reluctant partners. You know, Austin had teased that he was going to use Harvey Whippleman or Brooklyn Brawler. Eventually it becomes Sean. Sean is making it clear. Nobody likes me around here. I don't know if you want to do that. Uh, and he are, is successful in his quest to become tag champion with Steve Austin. They beat Owen and Bulldog here. And you push on commentary that this is Sean's first match in four months. Austin's going to get the uh, three count afterwards. Of course, the entire heart foundation jumps on Sean Michaels and Austin looks on walks past them and instead goes after Bret Hart at the top of the runway. And of course that leads bulldog and Owen in to make the save. Um, something happened to that match though. A way killer would report that Sean slide kicked Austin in the match by mistake as part of the angle. And Michael's actually accidentally damages Austin's neck. Austin apparently felt a sharp pain after the impact and his leg buckles and you can actually see that on the tape and he as a result is going to go see a few different doctors um they're saying there's no major damage but the mri is showing that he has the neck of a 60 year old and this is ahead of SummerSlam 97 when you heard hey maybe austin suffered an injury here in this match with sean does this just feel like a snake bit pay-per-view on our march there a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, luckily that, that, uh, first let's clarify it was a spot in the match that these two guys had called, but just the execution of it and the way where, where Steve was standing and how Sean kicked him, all the, the, the stars aligned, uh, unfortunately on that one, I know that Sean, that Steve found a great, uh, neurologist, uh, neck guy in, uh, 
San Antonio named, uh, I think his name is Lloyd Youngblood. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dr. Youngblood's got, eventually did the surgery on, Sean, uh, on the Steve. But uh, it was a delicate situation. All those years of football, you know, he was a tailback uh, in high school. And he, got, he carried the ball 25, 30 times a game. And most of it is straight ahead. Lower your head and go. So you don't know how you know, equipment as it was at that time. So football probably had a issue in his neck issues. Then he went to North Texas for the mean green and played defensive end, also striking people with his head and, and using his neck again, then wrestling. And then, you know, everybody, uh, was just free willy this, uh, these head, these chair shots, my God, it got to be where the boys were like, uh, who could make the loudest noise? Who could hit the hardest? Right. It was sad, man. It was, we just kept it condoning it. It was just not knowing all the repercussions of the long-term effects of CTE and all those things. So, uh, you know, we, we just held our breath because anybody that had any sense that didn't have a dog in the hunt, uh, like a buddy who Steve was passing up on the roster could see that he was our, he was, our, he was the next big thing. And we just, we wanted to keep him healthy as hell for a lot of reasons, not just that, but, uh, it was, a, it was, it was dicey, really, really dicey because we had big plans for Steve. And of course that, uh, kind of went out the, sh- the poop shoot on, uh, at SummerSlam that year, I guess Owen. Let's talk about the last segment on this particular raw. We're still trying to pay off this undertaker, Paul bear secret. It looks like it's finally going to come out undertaker, then grabs bear by the throat. And then after this long, awkward pause, he kneels at bear's feet and, uh, seemingly submitting, I guess that he doesn't want the secret to come out and the show comes to a close nitro does a 3.2 raw does a 2.78. Um, let's fast forward. Brett wrote in his book on June 2nd, I had an in-depth talk with Vince McMahon. He told me the company was in financial peril and that he was only just barely hanging on the next six months are either going to make or break him. He said, Ted Turner was hell bent on putting him out of business. And he told me he might have no choice other than to restructure my contract. Of course, I'd still get every dime he owed, but I'd get it on the back end years down the road. He added that he appreciated how hard I was working for him. And he told me not to worry about anything. I sure didn't want to receive the money owed to me now at the back of my contract. So I did call my lawyers who my options were Vince tried to do that kind of a move, but when it came down to it, I don't believe that he ever would do that. Did you, does Vince have a a talk with, I mean, you're making budgets. So does he sit down with you and say, Jim, what can we do? What are the suggestions? Or does he bring it to you and say, looking at this, I think we've got to restructure Brett. And do y'all have a conversation ahead of that conversation? Or do you find about it, find out about it after the fact? Well, I knew that we were, we were treading on uh, thin ice, you know, uh, to the point that he and I had a conversation at one point where, uh, there was casual, uh, casual may not be the word. It was a formal meeting, but you know, we talked about the option of, of bankruptcy reorganization. Uh, so it was serious, it was very serious. Again, for those of us that did take those cuts in pay, it was damn it was real too. I mean, you know, real, real stuff. You know, your check just shrunk a bunch, uh, uh after that. So, um, uh, but we knew we we're in, we we're cash flow was bad. Uh, we got to get something hot. We had to get some town over Somebody's got to get hot. We got to start drawing. We got to get some pay-per-view attractions, et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't have that. Uh, we were still working toward that deal, but then, you know, he, he said the Brett, I think that his words to me were the Brett deal now with this financial situation is going to be very problematic. Well, what do you, t- somebody tells you that you, you, here's what you, you, you know, you don't have to be a, a, a mathematician or an MBA to figure out the fact that we got to, we got to fix this thing. So we either got to get an influx of new cash and be able to honor Brett Hart's contract, or we got to go to Brett and say, Hey, look, we've made a mistake. Uh, we didn't realize business was going to be this way. We don't have the cash flow. We can't honor our agreement, but we want to restructure much like a, you see in the NFL all the time. We want to restructure. And, uh, and that's kind of where you, you kind of know that's one of those things is going to happen. But, uh, we didn't have a specific conversation about Brett, but I knew that his deal was tenuous. It was, it was a little, it was a little rough now because of the, of the, of the economy and our economy specifically. Let's keep it moving here. Uh, we're going to talk about the go home edition of raw on our way to King of the ring. But first I want to ask you about great Sasuke. 
He held a press conference on May 28th in Tokyo to announce that he had signed with the WWF. He says the WWF offered him a one-year contract, but he only agreed to a six month deal. How did great Sasuke come to be on your radar? Is he a guy who's trying to send tapes? Are you guys actively looking for a way to compete with the luchadors on nitro and the cruiserweights or how does this come together? Hey, uh, Victor Quinones again, brought him to us, uh, as our, um, as we were trying to get more diversified and to find some new talents that were fresh talents, you know, WCW that signed a lot of people, the indie certain, the indie situation then was not like as good as it is now. Uh, and so we needed some fresh talent, uh, that we could work with creatively and that could offer something that we didn't have. And that was the, uh, the kind group, the junior heavyweights. So, uh, Sasuke was the boss of that group, Michinoko pro. So he, that's how he, that's how he came about. Uh, again, Victor Quinones was our liaison with, with the Japanese and the Mexican promotion. This go home edition of raw opens up with the undertaker. Vince is trying to get an explanation out of him for why he did what he did. And he explains that he wasn't doing that to protect himself, but the ones he loved Paul bear wants to come out and say, Hey, you've done enough talking. Maybe I should do some talking and. Bear is going to say that now that he controls both mankind and the undertaker, he's going to be the ruler of the world. And at that point, Sid's music hits and you exclaim he's back. And you explain that he's been out with a lower lumbar back injury. And Sid sets the record straight that mm, first of all, fat man, you don't rule nothing. I rule the world. Sid's back here. Talk to me a little bit. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about Sid, but. This is a guy who developed a reputation for being in and out. And there's lots of rumor and innuendo and sort of inside jokes about softball. Was he really out here with a lower lum- lumbar injury? And, uh, what can you tell us about Sid's return and, and his uh, sabbatical, if you will? Well, I only had to, I had to believe that his back was bad and, and that, uh, you know, it was affecting his work, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, a lot of the boys will tell you that. You know, it was, it was softball season and he loved to play softball and, you know, he was an attraction in softball. You hit the long ball. You could, as you can imagine, he wasn't a bunner. He didn't move runners around. He didn't sacrifice anybody. He hit the long ball. So, but Sid, you, you keep giving, Sid kept getting opportunities because of his amazing and obvious unlimited physical potential. He had an amazing look. He was athletic for a guy, for a guy, his size. And so he had everything, he had it. And, uh, you know, I, I, but always something seemed to get in the way, always something adversely affected the progress of this guy that who really legitimately, if you're going to draw a picture of a big box off guy, then he's one of the guys you should draw because he's six, nine, you know, 300, he's ripped up. He looks great. And if you, the old Vince McMahon rule, you walk through the airport, is somebody going to notice, notice him? You're damn right. They are. So, uh, that was the, he's kept waiting that all the baggage of whatever it was self-inflicted baggage or, 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 uh, donated baggage on Sid was going to go away and he was going to finally be able to be what he, what he wanted to be and needed to be. It just never did happen in WWE. Let's talk a little bit about, um, the way we build to this Shawn Michaels, Steve Austin match here. Originally, as we said, this was supposed to be Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. You might wonder what was Steve Austin supposed to do? He's supposed to be finally paying off with a match with Brian Pillman. And they've been building this thing since the prior fall. It was the prior September, October when Austin broke into his house and Pillman pulled a gun. And this is supposed to be the big payoff. But according to the rumor and innuendo, Pillman wasn't all the way ready to go. Sean now needed an opponent. So you guys pivot on the way to the pay-per-view just six days prior and say, nope, we're going to have the tag champs face each other. Were you disappointed that Brian wasn't able to go or was this sort of an easy fix and you still had hope for the future? Well, it was certainly an easy fix and we had hope for the future. And yes, I was disappointed that Brian, uh, wasn't cleared. And the question was always going to be, then will he ever be cleared? Yeah. Cause it, since we should back that up, I guess when he first signed with the company, he had been in a Humvee injury uh, in a Humvee crash. And as a right. result, he just shattered his ankle, I believe. And, mm-hmm. 
and was not able to perform. So we've got lots of stops and starts where we think he'll be ready here. Nope. He's not. Okay. We'll think he'll be ready here. Nope. He's not. Okay. We think he'll be ready here. Nope. He's not. And eventually they do one of these where it's going to be an angle. Cause they know he's got to go have another surgery done. So on superstars in the fall of 96, you have Austin put his foot in a chair, jump off the top, crush the ankle, quote unquote. Then he does the surgery. Now he's got the big cast on. That's when Austin breaks in. So we're finally, he's moving around, but still not medically cleared. And it doesn't feel like at this point, you guys have gotten much of a return at all from your Brian Pillman investment. No, unfortunately we didn't. Uh, his ankle got fused, so he couldn't, he couldn't bend it. So it really obviously restricts uh, a very athletic, uh, 215, 20 pound guys, uh, mobility and a guy that size, uh, couldn't really afford to have that mobility restricted as it was. It was a heartbreaking thing. And, and the, I believe that it really contributed to Brian's death. Uh, the fact that he was so disappointed in his career because he knew in the back of his head that he could never do the athletic things that he used to do as flying Brian with a fused ankle. It's just, it was sad. And you could see that emotionally it was really working on him. And, uh, he had, he had, he had some, you know, some drug and alcohol issues. I remember I, I had him drug tested somewhere. Somebody one well, night before we were in some town and he was asleep on the floor in the dressing room. Of course, Jack Lanza gives me a call and tells me what happened. So I order, a I call the office and get my stuff together and we get a, a drug test. We've got a doctor there and he's got a pee in the bottle on the next night. And he was so irate. He called me at home and. I guess he forgot that, you know, I'm living in Connecticut and he was in Washington state. It's like 10 o'clock in Washington state. So it's 1 a.m. for me and the old phone rings and Jan answers the phone as she did more often than not. I think she got smart. Finally moved the phone to my side of the bed, but, uh, uh, I talked to him. He was cussing and raising the hell and I can't believe you'd do this to me. And I thought we were friends and all these things. And I said, Brian, we are friends. That's why I am doing it. Somebody's going to protect you from you. And so, you know, he had some, he had some, uh, pain medicine in him that he didn't have a prescription for, I think. And, and some things, you know, just uh, maybe some steroids. I'm not real sure, but this day is, is minuscule, uh, if he had any, but nonetheless, he was, he's the, the ankle fuse broke his heart because he knew he could never do what he wanted to do. And that's why I kept trying to convince him that he could be the next Jesse Ventura and be a great, to that crazy voice of his, a gravelly voice. He's very intelligent, very quick witted, understood the business, very well read, you know, up in pop culture and all those good things. But boy, he just hated that. He thought that was a huge, huge come down and would make him much less of a man that he wanted to be perceived as. It was a very sad thing that Humvee accident really, it didn't kill him. The accident didn't kill him, but the results of the accident, I think led to his death. We'll talk about Brian Pillman more another time. I'm sure uh, we see, um, Vince interview the road warriors and he's asking them if they ever had problems getting along. And of course they deny it. And he's asking this because they're about to take on Sean Michaels and Steve Austin, who are both threatening to beat the shit out of each other. LOD gets the win by count out. So Austin and Michaels retain the tag titles. Um, then we see part three of the interview with mankind. And you're asking what fuels the insanity. And he's telling the story about cactus Jack. And we're finally acknowledging cactus Jack, which WWF had really never done before. And he talks about the quote, sadistic wrestling subculture in Japan with deathmatch wrestling. This was like bizarre to me as a longtime WWF fan to see you guys acknowledging anything else happening, much less death match wrestling from Japan. What's Vince's stance on this? How did he soften? And what did he think of fucking death match wrestling? Well, it wasn't a matter of that. We're going to start endorsing death match wrestling. It was a matter that we're going to acknowledge that it exists. And that in itself was a major step forward for Vince. Uh, that there was a world outside WWF at that time. And as I said earlier, sometimes even the most, uh, uh, established, uh, organizations, and there's no organization any more established than WWE, sort of none more profitable, uh, that sometimes even those companies have got to sit back and say, we want, we might want to put the reset button and change our philosophy a little bit and, and, uh, amend what we're doing creatively. Our presentation needs to be tweaked. It, maybe that's time. Maybe. 
that's now for those guys. I don't have a clue. That's their deal. But bottom line is every company's got to do that periodically. You, you, in an entertainment world, you can't stay status quo. There's only a few things that work that way. Uh, you know, even, even the Jeopardy, this cat win all that money. Uh, they do a 30 minute show it takes them 22 minutes of content. Uh, it's a little different animal, but the bottom line is most shows have to have con constant, uh, tweaking and I'm sure they've made some tweaks over the years, but nonetheless, it's a different animal, but it's hard to keep something, uh, on television, the same year after year after year after year, even, you know, we see our news chains and we see weather men. Now we got weather women and we got female meteorologists. We got female sports anchors. Things are changing. And so we need to change. And I think that we are, are acknowledging these other organizations and what, Hey, we, we had, we kind of acknowledged that with the billionaire Ted stuff and all that stuff too. So it was just a matter of Vince changing his mind on how he was going to perceive things, how his positioning. And, uh, you know, some are saying, as I mentioned earlier, not being an asshole, but maybe it's time for him to do that again. Let's talk a little bit about, um, what's next on the show. We've got undertaker and Sid for the world title and you can't help yourself. You say that Sid swings the best baseball bat or best softball bat in all of the world wrestling federation, which is kind of fun. <laughs> what a wise ass <laughs> undertaker gets the pin. Of course, NOD interferes at the end. Once the match is over, uh, and, and that's our go home show, uh, just a few weeks uh, or a few months prior to this, uh, Sid and undertaker was the main event of WrestleMania. And here it's less than five minutes with a clean pin. Does that tell us that Sid's fallen out of favor or is it just, we're trying to sell the pay-per-view? No, it, it told you, well, we're trying to sell the pay-per-view obviously, but it told you that, uh, the, the front office had lost confidence in Sid at that point in time. And, uh, his push, his priority as uh, being reevaluated. So, uh, in you know, the match that undertaker and Sid had at WrestleMania 13, I'm sure if you ask both those gentlemen, they'd tell you that it wasn't their best match that they've ever been involved in. It was a little bit, uh, but it had to follow Brett and Steve and that's tough. That's really tough. So especially on that night. So, uh, they were in a tough spot, but nonetheless, Sid did kind of fall out of favor on that one. And it's an, under, and it's an unfortunate Conrad, because again, I always thought that Sid had everything look demeanor, every, the whole nine yards, uh, just it's for whatever reason, we just couldn't quite get him over the hump. The uh, show in the ratings winds up with a 2.78 nitro that night gets a 3.28. Let's get to the real show reason we're here. King of the ring, 1997, you guys drew 9,312 fans. The gates, 202,963 bucks. The arena is set for 16,000, but only 9,300 are here. You once or twice in the show reference that there's uh, 10,000 fans here. But McMahon multiple times calls it a capacity crowd. And Vince always did that. He always called it a capacity crowd. Even if it wasn't sold out, do you think Vince knows what capacity crowd means? <laughs> oh, I think he probably does. I think it's just part of his damn vernacular. I, sure. I, it's like the old, he said about me, he can't help himself. JR can't help himself. I don't think that's the, that's, that's the promoter in him. And so he overlapping roles of being the promoter, the owner of the company and the, uh, lead broadcaster. So no, he, he, he had a habit of doing that. You know, for all those, for all those years, we thought that the WrestleMania three did 93,000 people. Hell, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I saw it on, on closed circuit actually. Uh, but uh, we find out at the end of the day and the, when the, when the newsletters and the Meltzers and the Kellers of the world found out it was 78,000, that was a, that was a headline for whatever reason, you know, McMahon embellished the, this dome crowd. So I, you know, hell, I don't know. I, but yeah, it's, it, I wasn't comfortable with that. And, and, and he never said anything to me about that though. And it was all, what I said was the truth and it was a good crowd. We get the shots are good, but yeah, it was about a half a house. Let's talk a little bit about, um, Vince as a, a broadcast partner. I like you didn't remember that you guys did commentary together on this. How would you categorize the roles? I know traditionally people think, okay, this guy's play by play that guy's color, but a lot of times throughout this show, Vince is trying to do play by play. And that feels like that should be the other way around. Did you guys have a conversation about that? Or did you know, Hey, it's his show. I'm just here to support him. However I can. 
I knew my role. My role was going to be the color guy. Uh, Lawler was not with us that night because he was in the tournament. So it was Vince and I. And uh, so my role didn't change. This is always the lead. When it was he, Jerry, and myself, he was still always the lead. And then he, Jerry and I would fill in basically Jerry first and I would get, pick up whatever's left. I had no problem with that, quite frankly, but, uh, yeah, I had no, that we, we knew what the role, I knew what my role was going to be. That's why in that show, if folks go back and listen to it, you'll hear so much background information. I felt it was, you know, my storytelling, uh, theory is that, you know, we've got to continue to tell these, the audience who these guys are and why they're here and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I did a lot of background information on that show. And I think I did it at the, I was, I was pleasantly surprised at how I did it when I watched the show back because I didn't really uh, step on any dramatic moments or high spots or false finishes or anything like that. It was done at a time where there's either rest or separation or during an entrance, we get some of that background information in, but I thought it helped the show and it told everybody who, who, uh, who these guys were. And we were had lost an audience. We're trying to gain an audience back. So we thought with new people coming back, they might not know the backstory of all these cats. So that's kind of what we did. But, you know, I knew my role was going to be the color guy. And quite frankly, uh, uh, it worked out fine. Your dark match that night was the headbangers getting a win over Bart Gunn and Jesse James. Uh, that would have been a, a weird version of the new age outlaws. It's the wrong smoking gun here. The headbangers get the win in six minutes and 10 seconds. And Meltzer would note before the show started, they do an angle. That's simply for the live crowd where they're trying to remind everyone, Hey, mankind's a face now. So mankind comes out to cheers since he's without Paul Heyman and cuts a baby face promo and Lawler appears on the video screen and does a heel promo. Uh, I guess they just wanted to sort of prime the audience for our second match on the card, but let's talk about the first match. We open it up with Ahmed Johnson coming to the ring, or I guess he could have been Buck Johnson. Uh, <laughs> thankfully Bill Watts wasn't around for that. Uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley is out next. This is supposed to be his year in 1996 to win the King of the ring. Of course, we know he's now going to claim that crown here in 97. They go seven minutes and 42 seconds. This is a King of the ring semifinal. The match is okay, but I was reminded watching this, why I was not a huge Ahmed Johnson fan. What'd you think of the match watching it back for the first time in 20 something years? I thought Hunter got uh, much out of Ahmed as could humanly be done. Ahmed was still very green. Uh, you know, again, you, you guys have this great look, but I don't know if he had a feel for the game. Uh, and I thought he, he may, he, he had, he may have listened to the wrong people too. He seemed to always not trust anybody. And, you know, you get in this entertainment world, you got to start trusting somebody somewhere, find your little inner circle. You can, you can count on and trust those dudes. Uh, but I, I thought Hunter got as about as much out of Ahmed as he was going to get. And you saw the value of, uh, of Joni of China, uh, how that she was used. I can assure you that, uh, that Paul Levesque helped set out, lay out that match from start to finish, which shows you his ability to do those type things. And I thought he did a nice job. And, uh, but I think it was a surprise that to Ahmed lost because Ahmed kind of going into this thing was, you know, we kind of made him the pre tournament favorite because he was so impressive and he hadn't been touched. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people would have thought that Ahmed Johnson was the favorite. He hadn't lost a lot on TV. It was a big deal when he finally did lose. Uh, you guys made him the Kuwaiti cup champion once before. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I guess belief that Ahmed was going to be the guy, but Hunter picks up the win here with a very jacked China and you're pushing that she's benching over 300 pounds and it's remarkable to see this early footage of China, considering what we know she would look like when we knew her later, after she had had some augmentation and some enhancements, a little nip, a little tuck. Uh, but seeing her in her 1997 form is probably the way I still remember her the most. Yeah. It was, uh, brought back a lot of memories to see her. Another thing that brought back memories, folks, if you watch that show back, uh, on the WWE network or YouTube, wherever you see it, uh, me and Gene Okerlund did voiced over the cold open, like a voiceover guy. And I didn't realize that I went back and listened to it the second time. And it was, it brought tears to my eyes because of Gene's voice was full and clear and clean. And if you don't go back, if you go back and watch this show only to hear Gene's open, which is like a minute, uh, voiceover style, uh, it'd be worth it. You'll, you'll appreciate his work, his skills at that time. But Joni was a big asset and I got a hand it to Hunter. 
Hunter, uh, not that Joni was not a, uh, not a dumb woman. She was not by any stretch, but Hunter really had a great feel for the, 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 the pair of them, the character. And he did a great job in molding her and getting her to be in the right place, the right time, the right demeanor, no nine yards. And she was very consistent with it. She played her giving very, very well. And, uh, we realized that they were going to be a money, money group pair. But at that time, you get the same thing. You could tell with, uh, with, uh, we, we talked about with Sid earlier, Ahmed, we kind of moved on from Ahmed. That's why Ahmed didn't win the tournament. He just, he wasn't ready for it. And, uh, there was not a trust factor there that was, everybody was comfortable with. I want to mention Jerry Lawler is in our next match here. And of course, everybody in this era is talking about how, you know, Jerry Lawler's old or over the hill or whatever. He's only 47 and the undertaker who's going to wrestle tomorrow in Saudi Arabia is 54. So just keep that in your purview. When you watch King of the ring 97, again, uh, mankind, Gets a win here over Jerry Lawler. 10 minutes, 24 seconds with the mandible claw. Of course, beforehand, we see an interview that, you know, mankind's trying for the crowd. It doesn't feel like anyone's really reacting to it beyond Vince McMahon, who's forced to. And then Lawler comes out and does his usual, hey, I'm going to crack jokes on everybody on the way there. What do you think of the match? Meltzer gave it a star in three quarters. I thought it was better than that uh, after watching it again. Uh it was, it was everything I thought it would probably be. I, I wasn't disappointed. They didn't do any, they did not do anything. I thought they should, or didn't, they should have done or whatever. So I, I, I disagree with Dave on that one. Uh, I thought it was a little bit better than a star and a half, but nonetheless, uh, it shows you again, the magic of the heel Jerry Lawler. So if any, any of you guys are listening there, any students of the game that want to look at somebody that's a textbook or you're a wrestler and you want to understand more about crowd psychology and then that's a great, uh, 10 minutes and 24 seconds of your time that I would certainly check out. Let's talk a little bit about the next match, uh, but before we do, I want to talk about Brian Pillman. He's doing an interview backstage. Steve Austin sneaks up behind him. We, the viewer at home can see that Austin's behind him, but of course, Pillman has no idea he's right behind him. <laughs> and then Austin attacks him and then eventually puts his head in a toilet bowl. And magically as luck would have it, there's a camera over the toilet. So we can, I don't know who installed that. I don't, I don't know if that was Klondike bill or who, but there's a camera over the toilet and you see Pillman's head go into the toilet. And of course, Austin flushes, um, who hands that piece of creative to Pillman. And does he feel like, oh shit, man, I got to get this ankle working. Cause they're going to do all kinds of weird shit to me if I don't. Well, uh, you know, maybe TL Hopper actually had that idea. I'm not sure. TL Hopper, uh, <laughs> the, the plumber with the plumber crack. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking that's a creative idea. It might've been a Russo idea. I'm not real sure. To be honest with you, it, was, it came from creative, but I could promise you that if Steve and, and Brian had not liked it, thought it was entertaining, uh, then they wouldn't have done it. And they had to clout. Both of them had the clout to say, I'm not going to stick my head in a toilet stool. But I thought one of the great shots there, if you guys again, go back and see this, Brian's hair, it's like his hair, uh, he, his head is in the toilet and his hair is all over the, it is like a big ball of hair uh, in the toilet stool. Like if somebody, you know, a cat, a big cat, a hair ball, it was funnier than hell, but it showed that Austin didn't care about anything or anybody do anything to, to, to prove his point, et cetera, et cetera. He's the rattlesnake and uh, rattlesnakes don't make good corporate pets. Somebody once said. Next up, we've got Goldust working with Crush. Meltzer would write, this match killed the crowd. Wow. He gave it a dud rating. Not a great match. Is this just, um, it, it, they don't gel? I mean, some of this is blamed on Crush and the Observer. Meltzer would write, Crush is just awful. Basically, he's Jim Duggan without the charisma. Lots of long nerve holds and chin locks. Is this just, you know, the chemistry's not there? Or does Crush just suck? I thought, uh, I think that there's no chemistry there. There's no chemistry. There was no chemistry there. They didn't jive. You know, I think sometimes, uh, uh, Brian, AKA crush was Brian was very high on his, uh, uh, on himself. Uh, and I understand and that's good, but he might not have been as good as he perceived that he was. He had every physically he had, he was gifted, no doubt. 
and a nice guy, good looking guy, strong. Uh, when they did the, the vignettes, WWE, the vignettes with him in Hawaii, I thought that was his best work, best positioning. He never did make a great heel to me. And he and, and, uh, and Dusty just did not have good chemistry for whatever reason. It's not, a, you know, again, it's not a bad thing. You know, a lot of guys, no, nobody's ever going to tell me that Austin and Undertaker had great chemistry together. They didn't. Uh, but they had, they had a lot of matches, but they, they didn't have their best matches with each other as they did with other people. That's just a chemistry thing. And that's kind of what we're here with, with crush. I don't think he was a bad worker. was he, I don't think he was a great worker, but uh, he certainly was better than th- that match would have should have indicated. Let's talk about the next match. Uh, it's Owen Hart teaming up with Jim Nodhart and Davey boy Smith to take on psycho Sid and Legion of doom. The Hart Foundation get the win in 13 minutes and 37 seconds. Uh, star in three quarters. Maybe not the um, the best match these guys ever had. Lots of good workers in here. Lots of Hall of Famers. But I thought this was a bit of a miss. What did you think? Yeah, uh, too many cooks in the kitchen, I think. Too many agendas to take care of, uh, in my view. Um, you know, I, I, they beat Sid in the sixth. And Owen beat Sid. Owen beat Sid in a little uh, sunset flip thing. Uh, when Sid is looking to do a power bomb, I think Davy boy, um, uh, I loved, uh, Owen and, and the anvil and Davy. Uh, it was clear to me that while Davy and, and Neidhart were very, very viable, valuable hall of fame guys, that uh, the star of that team was Owen Hart. That's we forget how good he was. He was amazing in this match. So, uh, I would say that, uh, if Meltzer believes that it was a, uh, one and three quarter star, uh, that might not have been, it might not have been one star without Owen in the match. But again, the, uh, uh you know, you, it's, it, the chemistry was, it was tough and not good chemistry in that match. Not a great booking by us, quite frankly, thank God Owen had a good night. And, uh, but the match should have been better with all that star power in there, but there, you got to remember, man, there's a lot of egos. A lot of alpha males, a lot of guys don't like to sell. And when you get into a situation where guys believe that selling is a weakness, not only are they showing their ignorance, but it's also going to make the match suck. You got to sell no matter who you are. Andre sold. So why can't you type thing? Hmm. Never heard that before. That's a great line. Uh, next up Hunter Hearst Helmsley becomes King of the ring. He beat mankind in 19 minutes and 26 seconds to win the tournament. Uh, Meltzer would say the fans were not into this first half of the match. He says that eventually they worked hard enough that the crowd started to get behind the match, but quote, they must've seen this as an unworthy finale. Um, Meltzer only gave it three and a half stars. Mankind's crawling to the back, you know, on his hands and knees. Um, this of course happens after, you know, a, an absolute melee after the match. Um, Helmsley's pulling off his mask and all kinds of crazy spots. They're going through tables and, uh, they're breaking the scepter over him. And it's, uh, it's one of the first big beatings that we see Mick take in the WWF. And he's doing this, of course, to, to get the, the baby face sympathy. What'd you think of the execution? And what'd you think about the long delayed crowning moment where Hunter finally became King of the ring? I really liked the match. Uh, I thought that, uh, Hunter and Mick did a, a really good job in Joni. Uh, you know, they did almost 20 minutes of intense, intense action until a great story, very physical. They added some very unique spots to it. So I, I liked the match. I thought it was really, really good and, uh, happy for both guys, uh, quite frankly. So, you know, we knew Mick was on his way to being something special without winning the King of the Ring tournament. He was, he was getting there very, very readily and very obviously, uh, as far as Paul Levesque is concerned. Uh, you know, his time had come and he'd earned that opportunity to, to be the king of the ring. And I thought it was a good move. Uh, you know, I, I never was a big, I was never a proponent of the punishment bullshit, you know, guys, the, the, uh, the, uh, curtain call thing, and then he's going to be punished. And, you know, all this, I, w- w- the, whether that happened, which I assume it did in, certain, in a lot of ways, it never happened that way with my mind. I never did anything of booking him or whatever. I could only book him to where he was on television. So it's like saying, well, JR, you could have put him in main events. Not if he wasn't on television in a role, that'd be stupid, disconnected booking. So, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a, not the, that was, that was not a thing for me. You know, I, I, uh, 
you know, I, I, I just, I, I didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't, I liked the match, uh, but I didn't, I didn't like the, the criticisms of they did too much. You know, Mick may have done too much. He was taking bumps in the apron to the concrete floor, dropping elbows. And you know, there's no way you can protect yourself. It's one of those moves where you cringe when guys do moves that are unprotectable. It's just a fait accompli that at some point you're going to take your last one like that. So, uh, you, we, we always had to try to restrict Mick, but it's hard to do. You know, he's, he's going to do what he got to do, but I thought they had a hell of a match Conrad and, and uh, I was glad to see how it came out. It's one of those matches where a guy can lose and still get over and Foley lost, but his toughness and the story we told, I think made him even more memorable, uh, or as memorable if he had won the damn thing. Let's talk a little bit about the post-match where Hunter destroys the crown. Um, Meltzer would, would freestyle that, Hey, maybe this means the gimmick is it's going to be King Hunter and queen China, but the guy who made the crown Andre Freitas down at AFX studios in Marietta, Georgia says that the reality is Hunter fucking hated the crown and he would stomp it every night. So the WWF kept asking for more. He just didn't like the look of it. And as a result would try to turn it into a piece of business where he would destroy it whenever they would have another one for him. Do you remember hearing that? For whatever reason, Hunter didn't like wearing the fucking crown. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't like it. Uh, too gimmicky. Um, wasn't his style. Thought it didn't, just didn't fit his persona. Uh, you know, so, you know, I, I don't know. Is it, uh, it's one of those things where it's almost a rib. Those guys got to take your crown the road with you now. It's like a lot of guys, there's giving, there's been guys I know in the business, Conrad, that didn't want to be a champion because, uh, uh, they, uh, didn't want to carry the belt. They didn't want to take the damn thing through, through TSA and security and take it with them. So silly shit, but so, it, it, it came, so they thought of it more as a prop than something to have to draw money, uh, and something real and tangible, like the fans would perceive it as. So I guess, I guess, and I know this sounds weird, but why the insistence on Hunter using the crown, you didn't have Austin do it the year before in 96. I mean, that would have been super goofy, right? Stone cold King Austin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think he may have thought he was in that same level of, uh, uh, perception. It just didn't fit his, his gimmick in his mind's eye. And so he didn't, he didn't use it. And, uh, that's where you listen to your talent. You know, I, I didn't, you know, it wasn't my idea to have him do the crown stuff. I'm with him. It's kind of hokey. And so I, I agreed with the hokiness of it, but, uh, you should always listen to your talents to tell you why they're uncomfortable or whatever, and how we can make amends to this thing and get back to where we want to be. And I don't know that he was ever asked that question. He had to work very hard to get back in the good graces of the, of the chairman. Talk to me a little bit about when, cause we've covered, you know, the, the curtain call here on the show recently, we've, we've established that he was supposed to be King of the ring in 1996. He's going to get that moment here in 97. When do you remember it becoming clear that, okay, we're going with, uh, we're going with Hunter on this one. I think that around this time, yeah, around this time, you know, the commitment to make him the champion or the king of the ring was, uh, nobody was not met with a lot of, uh, with any pushback. You know, I, I, so, so my role is a different role than some of the, the creator guys. See, I, I wanted him in the locker room. I wanted him to be inv involved. I thought I liked his intelligence, his intellect, his IQ. He was very reliable. He was not a drug and alcohol guy. He always knew he was going to be there and he had, he had a great skill set. You know, killer Kowalski had taught him very, very well. So, uh, but about that time is a year later from all that, uh, curtain call stuff. And, you know, it's, you know, we all had slept since then. Let's go. So young guy, you know, you get six, four, you know, looks, looks good. And student of the game, why not invest in him? And we, and I think I remember signing him to a million dollar a year downside contract setting on an anvil case in the back of the Evansville arena remember, vividly. We signed a contract there and he got, he got, he, he just wanted to make sure that he was getting the same thing that we were paying downside. We're paying, uh, the other top guys. And that was the maximum at that time that talents were being paid. No one in the company at that time had over a million dollar downside guarantee. What year would that have been if you had to guess? Oh, 90 around this time. No yeah, way. Not in 97. You guys are hemorrhaging cash. So 99, maybe. Mm, 
I mean, cause 98 is when he got hot, when Austin leaves. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It might've been, it might've been Con- Conrad's hard to remember these many years sure, back. Sure. I remember being on sitting on the anvil case for some crazy reason. I remember being in Evansville. I remember being in the nineties. So <laughs> good enough. Well, you know, the fucking day, I don't remember what, what year it was. Uh, I, I could go back and look at when we were in Evansville around, around those times, I guess. But, uh, but he was, a, he was a good investment and it, pay, pay, it obviously it panned out. Our right. judgment was right. He was a very good investment and he's panned out and, and made the company a lot of money and himself a lot of money. And he's done well, Marion. Yes, no doubt. Nobody's going to argue that. Let's go to the next match. Sean Michaels and Steve Austin. They go to a double DQ in 22 minutes and 29 seconds. Normally when you hear double DQ, you think, well, that's a fuck finish. This is going to get murdered in the observer, but it didn't, it got four stars. Uh, I guess we should mention here that, uh, Sean Michaels goes for the super kick. Austin catches the foot, hits the stone cold stunner, but there's no ref to count the pin because wouldn't you know it? There was a ref bump. Austin gets uh, up and he's so mad at the groggy ref that he gives him the stunner. And then Michaels super kicks Austin and has him pinned. But of course the referee was just pinned. It's referee Tim white. So a second ref comes in, but instead of counting as Michaels had him pinned, he goes to check on the first ref white eventually gets up and counts as Michaels has Austin pinned, but Austin kicks out. So now Michaels is frustrated that he didn't get the pin when he had him down that long. So he super kicked the second referee and Earl Hebner, a third referee comes in and DQs both referees or both competitors for attacking different referees. The fans mm-hmm. are chanting bullshit here. Uh, but this is a pretty cool match. I enjoyed it. Uh, two of the all time greats and we're getting a, a sneak peek of what WrestleMania is going to look like. What? Six months later, uh, nine months later. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, uh, I thought they had a hell of a match and it's kind of a forgotten match. Right. Uh, you know, it's not one of those matches where you, if you think about Sean versus Steve, you think about, uh, WrestleMania. uh you think about WrestleMania where Steve beat Sean for the title. That's the primary thing that comes to my mind. This hell this, uh, excuse me, this King of the ring match had kind of escaped me. I had forgotten about that match. I really enjoyed watching it. They told a hell of a story, you know, and then the, the, uh, the, uh, Bret Hart, uh, Hart foundation stuff was, uh, all also played in that deal. Cause Brett was supposed to come down and do commentary. We lost it. We got screwed up in our headsets. So I think, uh, uh, Foley and, and Hunter, uh, demolished our area that actually screwed up the, some headsets. So we didn't have an extra pair of headsets for uh, Brett to use. And there's a little dialogue between Vince and I about him. I'll take mine give, I'll give you mine or whatever, but it just never did work out that way. And, and, uh, so Rhett didn't come out there and couldn't do color, but, uh, it was a chaotic, all that was chaos. And the heart foundation had a lot to do with the success of that, that Sean and, and Steve match. I thought this is the threat of what they, what they're doing. And here they are. And they we told us, we told multiple stories in one match. We've married Steve and Brett back together. We established Sean has issues, uh, obviously, and the heart uh, the heart foundation loathes Sean, and that'd have got Steve too if he'd been in the, in the ring. But he was, he left to go get Brett, so it was a one of those Wild West nights, and I really enjoyed. That was a lot of fun. If you watch that again, folks, watch the interview with Brett did before, and all the interaction with the Heart Foundation, and then the, the post match that Conrad outlined was some pretty damn good stuff, and it just showed that these two. The t- they, look, remember. Austin and Sean were the tag team champions at that time. Right. They were the top tag team in the WWF and they're fighting each other, uh, because of the, the, the circumstance we outlined. So, but they had one hell of a good match. And if you like great wrestling and old school philosophies, uh, selling comebacks logic, this is a good one to watch. Yeah. It's fun too, to see Sean with an edge here, because of course, in this era, Austin's running around flipping everybody off. And when Sean flips him off, it gets a reaction from the crowd and you know, half the crowd at this point loves Sean and the other half loves Austin. There's a lot of, uh, fan response from this one. So it makes for a good viewing. Go check it out. If you're going to watch one match this week, uh, from your way back machine, go watch this one next up though. The main event, uh, not as good two and a quarter stars in the observer undertaker and Farouk go 13 minutes and 43 seconds. Of course, undertaker gets the win. Uh, Meltzer would say that the NOD had a lot of presence when they started the gimmick, but it's lost a lot of steam, probably because it's been overexposed. What do you think about Farouk's performance here and just the gimmick of nation of domination? Was it running its course here? 
Yeah, it was beginning to run its course a little bit, uh, but I'd love the, if we could have, in today's world, again, go back to today and then, then you could kind of get away with some of this, uh, the racial overturn, overtones, uh, the John Carlos, uh, uh, 1968, uh, you know, uh, protest in the Olympics, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, like their names were, uh, they were protesting, uh, how blacks were treated in America with a black fist raised in the air, very memorable. So that militancy, it was not something new to our psyche, uh, but, uh, it, it had not been played out that definitively in wrestling before. Uh, that's why you know, all those years that in wrestling, if you could go back and remember the first heel, I remember in wrestling, there was a main event level heel because he, he was not afraid not to take the heat of the crowd was Ernie Ladd. Most promoters were, were very cautious, uh, that they had their black, their black representative on their roster. The, the we have one scenario, uh, was a baby face because you couldn't stand to get the, you would get the, the heat that uh, the white audience might have on a black heel. Ernie didn't care. He just cared about the green. That was money. But I thought that things started to run its course a little bit, you know, uh, uh, but I liked the concept of it. I thought it was a really an interesting, compelling, uh, almost uncomfortable watch sometimes. Very controversial. But it, I don't know if it was ahead of his time or behind his time, Conrad, but for heels, uh, it worked out real well and they had a good cast. You know, I thought D'Lo Brown did a good job there. Eventually, uh, you know, Godfather in that group. Uh, I thought little Clar- Clarence Mason was pretty entertaining. You know, he looked the part, he was a lawyer for real. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, I liked the, the thing and what I, what I, if I was booking today, would I do it today? Of course not. No, but I liked it then it worked out very well. And Ron Simmons deserved that opportunity after being a WCW world champion. Uh, great athlete, athlete, great accolades, and he's been loyal to us. Ronnie is a great team player, and he and Bradshaw and the APA were a very, very underrated tag team. We should do a show sometime about tag teams and talk about the ones I've seen and talked about, and some of them were underrated, and some of them maybe an overrated. But Ron and, and Bradshaw are very, very good together. Uh, but I, I thought it was, I thought they had a solid Undertaker match. It was very. Uh, ground and pound oriented, very fundamental, very deliberate, but that's what we expected. And that's what we got. And so, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't have an issue. I thought it was a pretty good match because again, the booking side of it was very complicated because Conrad, there's so many moving parts. There's so many, uh, variables. There's so many spinoff characters in this one match. So it, I thought that was managed well. And they, those guys had a solid, solid outing. Well, and we hope we had a solid outing here for you today on this episode of grill and JR. And I want to tell everybody that we've got the rest of this Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels story, because the plot thickens the very next day after King of the ring 97, this is where we see the backstage fight happen in Hartford between Shawn Michaels and Bret. And, uh, we're going to get to that when we cover Canadian stampede, which is our next pay-per-view in 1997 and arguably One of the best pay-per-views the company ever produced. Let's run down what's coming up here on the next few weeks with grill and Jr. Next week, we're going to visit one of the biggest moments in Jr's career. King of the ring, 1998. Of course, lots of stuff happened on that show and it'll be fun to dig into 1998, but what everyone remembers is that hell in a cell. Jim, is it fair to say that's the match that is most synonymous with your commentary? Apparently so. I think you're right. It's the, it's the one I get asked. When I do these Q and A's and hopefully someday you and I'll be doing some of these Q and A's together as well. That question almost invariably always is posed, you know, what's your most memorable match. It's always what's your favorite match. I don't have a favorite match folks, but my most memorable match because I get asked about all the time is uh, take her tossing, uh, Mick off the top of the hell in a cell landing at our feet on the, but good. Thank God the concrete floor broke his fall. Oh my gosh. Listen to you. Uh, next up on June 20th, we're going to visit King of the ring 1994. And this is a match that's not remembered nearly as fondly Jerry Lawler and Roddy Piper. Uh, woo, not the best match those guys ever had. What do you remember about King of the ring 94? Um, that was it. <laughs> mm, that's a, uh, a little, a little, uh, uh, well, it could have been better booked, but. 
we'll talk about it. There's we, reasons. We will. And there's also some things that came out of that were pretty good. So that's why we do this show. Absolutely. Now the next week we're going to do something kind of fun. This is a bit of an experiment, but I'm looking forward to it. We're going to do our first watch along with JR and we're going to do it on June 26. Now, what will we be watching? We're going to watch bash at the beach. 96. I know what you're thinking. Hey, that's a WCW show. Jim wasn't there. That's correct. It's the show where Hulk Hogan turns heel and the wrestling world changes forever. It'll be fun to watch that with JR and get his commentary and his opinion on what the other side was doing. On July 4th, we're going to visit Great American Bash 1990, a very patriotic day. Sting wins the world title, draped in the American flag gear. He finally bests the Nature Boy Ric Flair to become world champion. On July 11th, we'll talk about Vengeance 2004, which will be Triple H and Chris Benoit. On July 18th, we'll pick up the story we just left off today, Canadian Stampede 1997. And then arguably one of the best shows in wrestling history, certainly one of the best WCW pay-per-views of all time. July 25th will be great American bash 1989 with Ric Flair and Terry Funk on top. And man, that's hard to beat, isn't it? Yeah, man. That's a good stuff. Every, all those years, as you're mentioning them, there's like these, these, uh, flashes of color and a pageantry and memories and smells and feels all come, come rushing back. So we got a lot of great things to talk about. And the neat thing is that being able to go back and retrieve all my memory, my lost memory or forgotten memory, like I did this week with this show specifically, uh, was it's fun to do. I, I enjoy doing that. A, you know, you got to remember Connie, that's, I was so busy all those years that I didn't go back. I don't, I cannot tell you, well, I can tell you, and I can take you conclusively. I, in my, all my years in WWE with my schedule as it was, I never one time went back and watched a pay-per-view or a raw or anything I was on in its entirety. Never did do it. It, it just, I didn't have time or the, or the desire. And I was always my own worst effing critic. I, I detested sometimes the things I said and how I presented it in my tone and inflection, even though a lot of folks liked it, sometimes I was very hard to please. So going back and now watching these a little older. Uh, not quite, not in the, not in the, the gun to my head. I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm back being good old JR, the wrestling fan. And God dang, I love that. And man, we appreciate you joining us here on the show. Tell a friend grill and JR is here to stay. We've got a hit on our hands. We appreciate all your support. Leave us a review and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and tell your friends about King of the ring 97 and be sure to remind them that we're not just talking about the show. We're talking about everything that's happening in the world wrestling federation during the months of May and June. And we'll keep that journey going next week. We'll look forward to seeing you next Thursday and every Thursday at 6 a.m. on your drive to work right here on Grillin' JR. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.